Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, families, friends of our students, alumni, there are a few in the room. It's a great pleasure for me as director of CIS to welcome you all to this uh, special session. As you know, this session is dedicated to the presentation of the work the students have realized as part of their courses uh, for several months of hard work to research on a specific topic and present today the result of these uh, months of research. The paper they have written has been already assessed by our uh, scientific directors, but today the task of the students is to present in 20 minutes the 60 or more pages they have written on this topic. And this is something they will have to make certainly in their life after the graduation. So it's a very good, very, very good exercise. Uh, Today is really the last, I would say, intellectual effort which is requested from the students as tomorrow it will be graduation. Doesn't mean you won't have to work intellectually in the future, but no longer in relation with this course and uh, hopefully you will be able to make use of all what you have learned during this year of, uh, of program. We know by experience that this room, it's getting very hot in the course of the day. There is unfortunately no air conditioning and therefore uh, we won't mind if you take off any jacket or whatever you, you have before you start sweating and uh, having difficulties to, to breathe. But uh, as it's a rule, I would like to ask those coming on stage to make their presentation for the 20 or with a question, might be 30 minutes, they will be on stage to wear their jacket or whatever is applicable for the ladies we have in our, in our groups. So thank you very much again, and uh, I wish you all a pleasant afternoon, and hopefully you will earn, learn a lot on the different topics which have been prepared by the students. And now I would like to ask uh, the first group to come on stage and make their presentation. Good afternoon, members of the scientific committee, classmates, families, and those who are watching us online. We're delighted to present our research that explores the sustainability of FIFA development projects. FIFA's flagship development program is the FIFA Forward, created in 2016, replacing the GOAL program. Our study aims to address the following question. To what extent are FIFA Forward development projects implemented sustainably? For this research, the definition of sustainability we chose to adopt is the capacity to maintain or improve the state and availability 
of desirable materials or conditions over the long term. Throughout our presentation, we'll also refer to legacy that, from a sports events perspective, is defined as the planned and unplanned, positive and negative, tangible and intangible structures created for and by a sport event, which remain longer than the event itself. In line with these definitions, we would like to start off by calling your attention to a case of an unsustainable football development project. From 2005 to 2015, the Pakistan Football Federation had received approval for the funding of eight projects by FIFA under its GO program. Technical centers, fields, facilities were planned to be built across the country. Some of the projects also received fundings from the Asian Football Confederation and the government. But out of the eight, only one, the Federation's headquarters, is complete and functional. The others were only partly used or underused, and one was cancelled. Misuse of funds, political instability, lack of financial transparency, and the stakeholders' disputes are among the factors explaining the unsustainability of these projects. And this example is just one among many demonstrated in football projects can fail to attend their development purposes and even leave unwanted legacies. During this presentation, I will introduce the rationale, the key concepts and key questions that our research addresses. Miko will proceed by taking us through a few of the case studies that were analyzed in our research, followed by Jai, who will present the key findings. And finally, Jules will outline the recommendations and conclude. In the world of sports, the significance of development is widely recognized by multiple international federations in their pursuit to improve the quality of their sports and increase participation. When it comes to football, we cannot think of development projects without thinking of the FIFA Forward program. Currently, in its third cycle, the program has grown as the total provisions for each member association per cycle went from $5 million up to $8 million over four years. As we can see, five categories of projects are available for member associations wishing to apply for funding. Infrastructure, capacity building, competitions, national teams, and special projects. But while FIFA's key mission is to make football truly global, it faces the challenge of having to provide support, fund, and oversee 211 member associations with uneven levels of development, priorities, challenges, and with huge cultural disparities. Which means that there is a vast variety of projects targeting diverse objectives, but within one singular same structure. This scenario led us to our overarching question. Considering so many discrepancies, to what extent are FIFA 4 development projects implemented sustainably? To address this question, we explore three underlining questions. Firstly, how do member associations select and manage development projects? In addition, what external stakeholders do member associations rely on to deliver the projects and how are they managed? And finally, how are legacy and sustainability incorporated by member associations into the projects? Through these questions, our study combined the concepts of project management, governance, stakeholder management, impact measurement, and legacy into one study to provide an interdisciplinary approach on international football development. Because most studies establish development programs reviews without analyzing specific projects and taking into account member associations' views, our research utilized an in-depth case study approach on member associations that had pro projects funded by the FIFA Forward with the aim of giving voice to the member associations. Now I will leave the floor to Miko that will take us through a few of the case studies that were analyzed in our project. Thank you, Bia. Ladies and gentlemen, as Bia mentioned, we did in-depth case studies on six different FIFA 4 projects from six different countries. Three infrastructure projects in Ghana, Mongolia, and Chinese Taipei, two competition projects in Argentina and India, and lastly, one capacity building project in Mexico. In this section, we will present three of our case studies. The artificial pitch project in Ghana, the Golden Baby Leagues project in India, 
and the Jugamos Todos project in Mexico. These projects represent three different development areas within the FIFA 4 program and provided interesting findings to our three underlying research questions. The artificial pitch project was initiated to provide football opportunities to previously deprived regions of Ghana. Bogotanga is an area with limited football facilities because of arid conditions, which contribute to poor soil quality and sparse water supply. The project was a part of a long-term strategy to build a national training center in the northern region of Ghana, coinciding with FIFA forward requirements for all member associations to have a headquarters, a stadium, and a training center built before expanding to other types of projects. This will ultimately set the country up for future football development. The FIFA forward program required the Ghanaian FA to own the land in which they built the pitch. The land was given as a concession by a high school in Bulgatanga and approved by the local chief. Furthermore, the project worked with a number of different stakeholders, like FIFA's regional office in Senegal and the local government. Through the Bulgotanga project, the association was able to offer opportunities for footballing talents in the Northeast region, but also involve the community by hiring 50% local workers. Moving on, as part of the All Indian Football Federation's objective to grow the game, the grassroots development project Golden Baby Leagues was launched in 2018. The aim of the project was to grow the, a new generation of football players in India and ultimately affect elite football success in the future. The project received funding under FIFA Forward 1, but the Federation would not apply for additional funding right away. The project would have limited resources over the next two years, and the budget only allowed for one full-time position to manage the project. In addition, the Federation introduced technology in the form of a mobile app that would make gathering data a lot easier. It also helped optimize the resources available. The project was reliant on independent operators as its activities grew. The Federation incentivized operators to host the leagues by giving them licensing rights and the flexibility to manage the leagues independently from a business perspective. The Federation had a clear long-term vision and identified five areas of impact in its first annual report. However, the team admittedly found it challenging to measure and quantify the project's fifth impact goal to grow and evolve a sustained game community. Lastly, the Jugamos Todos project was initiated by the Mexican Football Federation with the aim of activating children. The project activities are held in schools and provide children with weekly activities. It is currently integrated in 1,500 schools across Mexico and reaches 200,000 children. The head of sports development at the Federation was tasked with identifying reasons for Mexico's limited progress in football. This resulted in the discovery of huge gaps in the country's physical literacy. This resulted, uh, the Federation underwent three years of planning and scientific research, which shows a 36% obesity rate and 85% inactivity rate among children in Mexico. The research also showed that only one in 230 schools had a dedicated football pitch, and only 40% of all schools had a PE teacher. Furthermore, the Federation had a strong relationship with governmental stakeholders, but the political setup in the country meant that the Federation had to make individual agreements with each state and convince every teacher and principal to, partici to participate. The project aims to create a legacy of early age activity to help reduce physical complacency and obesity issues in Mexico. Jugamos Todos also maintains the goal of covering two million children by 2024. However, the Federation has no idea how to measure the social impact of the project. It is something that I would love to do, but don't have the tools to. I will now hand over to Jai to, to present our research findings. Thank you. Thank you, Mikko. Our research helped us uncover a number of factors organized into four main categories that seem determinant of sustainable projects in the development space. These factors are all interdependent, intercausal, and relevant to all of our research aims. Project selection and design is best when based upon research and validation. The Mexican FA spent almost three years researching and understanding the challenges of existing systems, which allowed them to build a sound methodology for the project. They hired consultants to build that methodology and tested it extensively as well before applying them. 
Since most development projects are not for profit and raising funds is challenging, they really must optimize available funding as well as leverage existing structures. For example, Jugamos Todos in Mexico realized that they could impact at greater scale if they actually repurposed and repainted existing concrete playgrounds rather than building new facilities. This obviously resulted in innovative project design. We learned that the thought behind project design and its actors is a base determinant of sustainability. We know now that managing and aligning stakeholders in the ecosystem of a project is essential. In Ghana, misalignment between the FA and the government led to increased costs and delays. In contrast, though, close alignment between the FA and the regional FA in Bolgatanga has seen the local community feel ownership of the pitch, and it has allowed for growing impact and sustained management. Managing stakeholders also involves education and ongoing governance. In the case of Jugamos Todos, the FA created a network of trainers to transfer that methodology and the benefits of that program from other regions to teachers in the school system of Mexico. These development projects also rely heavily on effective communication. In the context of FIFA Forward, F member associations will always have to manage upwards with FIFA. The Mexican FA cites constant communication with the regional offices as a core reason for their refunding and expanded ambition. FIFA can facilitate also greater communication between its MAs to enable knowledge sharing. This was a struggle for the Indian FA when building its Baby Leagues project, despite the fact that other FIFA members had run similar projects in the past. Our case study suggests that external communication used at the project management level can also help increase accountability. The Mexican FA used this by announcing the delivery of materials to their regional governments so that local populations were aware of that. Additionally, public rec recognition could be a vital tool to provide non-monetary incentives, which is very valuable for cash-strapped development projects. We found that a major form of legacy is generated through improved interpersonal networks. But how do we really calculate the value of those networks? Thinking about and planning for legacy before project design yields the best legacy outcomes. This intentional planning can help define metrics. For example, the Mexican FA identified specifically that their goal was to increase the percentage of time spent active during a physical education class. On the flip side, a lack of clearly defined metrics may lead to missed opportunities in really identifying the total project impact. These metrics help quantify legacies and are essential to feed virtuous cycles of interest and funding in these projects. Also, gathering and reporting data are seen as burdensome tasks as reported by some of the local operators in the Indian baby leagues. However, technology seems to be a solution to this barrier, with the Indian FA adopting mobile app to alleviate the burden. It is clear that a better holistic framework for development projects is required, standard with some room for flexibility. Legacy is an outcome, but it's also a process. Our academic reference describes the three types of legacy that typically yield from such development projects, namely product legacy, which is most commonly associated with infrastructure and technology, process legacies, referring to methods and project management practices, and people legacies, referring to the upskilling of populations. We find that they all feed into one another, with one example of the infrastructure proje project in Ghana, in Bolgatanga, enabling better and more conditions for matches, generating process legacies of facility management and people legacies of developing better players, coaches, and referees. Our research suggests that product legacies most often form the base of this ladder, if you will explaining why a majority of the forward program's funding goes towards infrastructure projects. Ironically, as we move up that ladder, the, val the, the value and the longevity of impact increasing, increases, meaning people legacies are most impactful. But the difficulty of measuring that impact also increases, given that people legacies are more intangible and take longer to yield true value. We found, in the end, that our definition for sustainability isn't complete. It refers primarily to the continuing operation of projects. We find that the additional reference to an ongoing capacity to generate measurable impact rounds off that definition very well. I'll now pass it over to Jules to offer our recommendations and to conclude. Thank you, Jai. 
So in order, to, in order to provide recommendations, it is essential that we look back to our underlying research questions. The first of which is how do member associations select and manage development projects? Regarding strategy setup, our project portrayed disparities between the six case studies, three of which used FIFA as, as key actors to help them in establishing long-term strategies. To address this disparity, which prevents long-term resource maximization, it could be useful to provide more project management and governance to member associations who currently do not establish their own strategies, to provide them with more autonomy and boost the likelihood of future project success. Our findings also uncover how member associations are in constant communication with their regional offices. However, another disparity is noted between the amount of assistance provided to each member association during their development projects. As such, it could be useful to implement further surveys and other feedback mechanisms to ensure that member associations feel they receive similar levels of support. Our second question looks at what external stakeholders do member associations rely on to deliver projects and how are they managed? Although governments are key stakeholders in providing financial and non-financial assistance, they also come with hindrance. And this was seen in the case of Ghana, where there was a failed promise from the Ghanaian Football Association by the Ministry of Finance. This led to huge delays in the project and, and huge inefficiencies. To resolve such issues, we, we would recommend to formalize these relationships. For instance, in Ghana, written contracts can be formed between the Ghanaian Football Association and, and the Ministry of, of, the Ministry of uh, Finance to prevent these demerge costs that they had to pay and they're still facing today. In contrast, we saw this formalization process work successfully in Mexico, where strong stakeholder relationships between the Mexican Federation and state education ministries resulted in overall impact on the project. This official written formalization could be incorporated in, into, the project, into the project application phase of member associations to improve overall project implementation. Having found that knowledge sharing between member associations is a crucial component of project delivery, it could be useful to facilitate better communication channels between member associations, as there is true value in sharing know-how to avoid the likelihood of poor project planning. We saw this in our case studies, as when we discussed with India, they were eager to, to understand what had happened in, during the Jugamos Todos project to learn lessons and apply it to their own case. Finally, when we look at how legacies and sustainability is incorporated by, by member associations into projects, overall we saw that the cases show that legacies are easier to achieve when projects are in line with long-term strategic planning. However, our study finds that although member associations incorporate the concepts of legacy and sustainability into the project planning phase, no metrics are currently used. This could, be, this could indicate a potential to incorporate such into future, into future programs. Having discovered in particular that capacity building projects tend to struggle with gathering impact data, it could be beneficial to use the academic metric of social return on investment, which is a cost benefit analysis that attempts to quantify these, these uh, social changes to create projects, um, to, to create a visibility of project uh, intangible factors. SROI incorporates both economic, social, and health factors and has been used by UEFA Grow to make the invisible visible. Imagine what could happen if we use this in the context of Mexico. Overall, the India Baby Leagues has shown the importance of targeting the youth in football development. Ghana Project has shown the importance of engaging communities in projects. Mexico has shown the power of football to go beyond, fo beyond football and to change health trajectory of a, of a nation. And finally, Mongolia has shown us that the air, in the Air Dome project that football can thrive in even the harshest of climates. So I'm sure you can all imagine what delving into the stories of 207 other member associations can show us. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the true power of football. And development is the only vehicle that can make it truly global. Thank you. Congratulations, Group 1. It's always difficult to be the first group to present. 
but uh, congratulations on your excellent presentation. Before we move to question, I have to make two remarks. The first one is that outside on a table, there is a booklet like this one with the different uh, summaries of the executive summaries of the different presentation, but also uh, the title of, uh, of the topic chosen by the groups, as well as this, uh, the, their name, which is also important. Some will have their names on, on the screen, but if not all, there you can find all, uh, all the, the details. My, my second remark is just to, to mention that uh, for each group, there is a supervisor uh, following the, the work of, uh, of the student during the several months uh, they are working on this uh, project. And in the case of this group one, the supervisor was uh, Dr. Heather Dichter. And now we can move to question. We have uh, two very elegant gentlemen in the room with microphones, and uh, they can uh, go to anybody who wish to ask a question. Professor Giacono. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your presentation. My question relates to uh, one of the topics that you addressed, which is sharing of know-how between the member associations. What kind of practical and concrete tools would you uh, recommend or would you envisage for such a sharing of know-how? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Professor Diakonu. Um, so in our study, we identified that one of the main gaps in knowledge sharing comes from the fact that all the member associations don't receive the same amount of attention from the regional offices. And therefore, we find that some member associations don't even know sometimes that another member association has undergone the same project. So one of our recommendations there was to provide more even support across the board and across the regional offices. Um, as, a first, as a first step to make sure that the MAs are actually familiar with the other projects. And then the second finding was um, that technology can be used more as a tool and to provide platforms where MAs can access the whole directory and lists of projects available under the FIFA Forward program that they can then learn from as well. Other question? Anybody is, uh, yeah. of course, allowed to ask questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm really claiming the opportunity to uh, put a question because I'm coming, I'm coming from very far. Um, I think my question is, uh, to what extent, uh, through your research, to what extent did you find that FIFA is open to some of your recommendations or would be open to some of your recommendations, some of your suggestions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, elegant gentlemen. Thank you for that question. Uh, we had several interviews with both people from the MAs, but also from FIFA. Uh, and as we spoke to them, both sides were very willing, very willing to, um, to learn from the findings and recommendations from our paper. And we even discussed social impact measures with the representatives from FIFA, saying that that's something that they want to look at in the future. So I do think that FIFA is willing um, to, to listen and look at at least the recommendations, but we know that 
we cannot change the world with a research paper, but we can find the recommendations from, from the research that we did. Thank you. Other question? Again, the questions are available for everybody in the Sorry. room. Uh, about uh, the criteria and the metrics to uh, make evaluation about the social impact of uh, a FIFA project. Some consideration may be interesting for the, the audience. Criteria and metrics to make uh, uh, evaluation about the social impact. Firstly, thank you for your question. Um, so this was actually something that we found throughout the process that a lot of the member associations wanted to establish, you know, metrics to kind of measure. And this is what brought us to kind of looking into the academic realm and seeing what's out there, what's being used to kind of quantify, because obviously we live in a very evidence-based society and we don't want to lose some of these potential gains that as we saw in Mexico, for example, and so this is why we looked and into and found the social return on investment. And essentially, to give an example, if, if we use the Mexican Federation, the Jugamos Todos project could contribute to alleviating the pressure on the, on the health, on, for example, the health uh, care of the nation. And so again, to quantify this, it, you'd need to go into and kind of see what is the cost to the, to the government of maybe treating someone with diabetes or, or et cetera. And so even though they've noted that there are some limitations with social return on investment because of, this, because of this uncertainty and kind of needing to estimate certain figures, but again, I think it's a first step to considering to try and quantify because all these things are not quantifiable, unfortunately, right now. Okay, we have time for one more question. If there is one. Is that Frankie? Yeah. I was surprised not to have uh, had any question from you. But. Uh, I, I had just a, a, a doubt. Is FIFA, from what you learned and from what you looked at, looking at what's happened outside football, on world development programs from major inter inter international institution. And how much do they care about what some of the, you know, the major institution uh, do uh, outside the field of football? Thank you for the question. Um, so, the simple answer to your question is that through our research, we found no evidence that FIFA is currently looking at metrics outside of the world of football. Um, the fact is that FIFA is the primary player, not only in the world of football in terms of development, but in the world of sport. Um, however, conscious of that, our group during our research process looked extensively at content and research that's been done outside of sport in the world of, in the world of development namely the UNDP and a few other programs, to understand how they really disseminate their programs, how they manage their relationships with stakeholders, because they are um, equitable in terms of size and scale to the FIFA Forward program. Um, and so some of the recommendations and learnings that we discussed today actually come from the realms of outside of sport rather than within sport itself. And we hope that FIFA and other organizations in sport can perhaps use that as a starting point to start thinking about how they can incorporate those findings. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you can leave the place to your colleagues. And now I invite group two to join me on the stage for their presentation. The supervisor for this group two 
was Professor Martin Pauli from the Montfort University. And you can start whenever you are ready. I guess I got to. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the scientific committee, fellow classmates, and those joining us online. Our final project presentation is focused on understanding the climate impact of fan mobility in football, specifically around the 2022-2023 UEFA Champions League and UEFA Women's Champions League competitions. The climate crisis is something that affects all of us around the world. Earlier this month, on July 4th, the world experienced the hottest daily temperature ever recorded. And the sports industry is both a contributor and a victim to the consequences of global warming. An example of this is the introduction of mandatory water breaks during matches due to the extreme heat stress athletes suffer in competition. The future of the Winter Olympics is at risk due to the lack of natural snow available. In the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Games, 98% of artificial snow was used in competition. And research conducted by David Goldblatt found that in England alone, one quarter of its 92 professional football club's infrastructure is affected by flooding each season. How the sports industry responds to climate change matters. And many sports organizations have been criticized for using sustainability simply as a marketing tactic in favor of commercial interests and revenue. Sports has a unique platform to raise awareness and inspire audiences to drive positive change. During our presentation, there will be a couple of key terms and concepts related to mobility and transportation that are important to understand. The first is CO2 emissions, also known as carbon emissions. This is the main way that energy is produced by burning fossil fuels, which releases gases into the atmosphere. For our research, we are focused on the indirect emissions that are produced by fans traveling to home and away matches. This is the largest contributor of emissions in the sports industry and the most difficult for clubs to manage. Secondly, it's very important to understand that different modes of transportation release different levels of emissions, depending on the type of vehicle, the number of passengers and the distance traveled, the amount of emissions released will be different. As you can see by the infographic presented on the right, you'll notice the number of carbon emissions produced per passenger per kilometer traveled by various modes of transportation. The Champions League tournaments are known across the world as Europe's most elite professional football competition. They bring together fans and clubs from across Europe each year in a quest for glory. This season, 48 clubs played 186 matches in 38 different cities across Europe. The total attendance across all matches was 6.8 million fans, and the total distance traveled between cities clubs were located was over 215,000 kilometers. To put that in perspective, that is equivalent to the distance of kilometers traveling around the circumference of the Earth 5.4 times. This highlights the magnitude of the challenge clubs have to manage the indirect emissions produced by fan mobility. During our presentation, we will outline the various research that we conducted in order to further analyze the indirect emissions produced by fan mobility in relation to the men's and women's UEFA Champions League competitions. Chang Min will present our data findings in which we analyzed the attendance rate, the distance, and the travel time across all matches played in both competitions. He will also share our learnings from interviews conducted with sustainability experts from within the football industry to better understand the programs they have implemented and the challenges they continue to face. 
Bear on Equal share our learnings from research conducted outside the football industry that highlight the transportation challenges that other event organizers also experience. And to conclude, Alex will present some key recommendations our group has considered to help mitigate the indirect emissions caused by fan mobility in the UEFA Champions League tournaments. I will now introduce Chang Min to speak about our data findings. Thank you, Adele. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So in our research, we created a data set from the group stage matches to the finals on both men's and women's Champions League. The data includes match day statistics on fan attendance, stadium between competing clubs, stadium from the airport to the stadium, and the estimated uh, travel time. So in our analysis, we made an assumption on the number of away fans based on UEFA ticketing regulations, which states that home, home clubs must make at least 5% of total capacity for visiting supporters. So our first key finding is about the attendance. The average attendance across all matches was around 46,000 fans. And as you can see on the uh, screen, attendance increased during the knockout stages, and particularly in women's competitions because women's teams playing their knockout stages in larger stadium compared to the group stage matches. And our second key finding is related to the distance traveled. The average distance between competing clubs is around 1,100 kilometers. And except for the men's final, which took place in Istanbul, Turkey, as the competition progressed, the average distance decreased. This trend can be attributed to the fact that stronger teams from Central Europe tends to advance to the knockout stages more often. And even in this season for the Men's Champions League, the two teams from Milano faced each other and it takes greater reductions. And our third key finding is related to the duration of travel. A key learning is that on average traveling to the stadium by public transportation takes twice as long compared to a driver driving a car. And additionally, limited public transportation service is available after the UEFA Champions League matches due to the late night kickoff times. So our goal was to use all these data findings to estimate the carbon emissions produced by fan travel across the entire competition. However, a limitation in our research was finding the exact mode of transportation and distance traveled by fans for each match because of how UEFA operate the competitions, where each club is responsible for ticket sales for their home matches. However, we are able to find the data on carbon emissions generated by fan travel in Germany Bundesliga for 2018-2019 season. And we applied this data to the home fans actually traveled to the Champions League matches this year played in Germany to calculate our estimations. The average CO2 emissions produced per fan per match from traveling in Bundesliga 2018-2019 season was 27.8 kilogram. And as I mentioned, we used this number and applied to the 1.1 million home fans that attends to the 29 Champions League matches that played in Germany to get to the result of 32.5 million kilograms of estimated CO2 emissions that produced only by only from fan mobility. To put, this, to put this into perspective, that is same as carbon emissions from the annual electricity usage of 6,000 homes. Our future research would include engaging with every club that participate in the competitions to gather data on mode of transportation, distance traveled by fans. Having this information would allow us to calculate the estimated the carbon carbon emissions produced from fan mobility across the entire competitions. Now I'll take you through our research within the football industry. Our research involved comprehensive case study and interview with stakeholders at various levels. We began by conducting an interview with UEFA, the governing body of European football. Additionally, we studied leading football leagues in sustainability, such as German Bundesliga, French League One and South Korea K-League, which provide us global perspective. 
And we also studied some of the leading football clubs in sustainability, such as Forest Green Rovers, Ulsberg, Real Betis, and Arsenal. Furthermore, we also conducted interviews with Arsenal fan group and various sustainability consultants that work with leagues and clubs. So during our interview with UEFA, they highlight the challenge of balancing fans' preference for football over sustainability considerations. As the organizer of the competitions, UEFA is responsible for creating a competitive product with commercial value as well. And in our interview with the k -League, we found the difficulty in gathering accurate data for calculating emissions. This makes it difficult to understand the actual impact of fan mobility on overall emissions. And Arsenal FC emphasized that providing sustainable options for fans must lead by example before expecting changes in fan behavior. This highlights the importance of education and also awareness on the impact fans can have in the journey towards carbon neutrality. Similar to UEFA's statement, the Arsenal fan group expressed a preference for exciting matchups, even if they may be less sustainable. They prefer facing AC Milan rather than Manchester United in the UEFA Champions League competitions. So all the different stakeholders are individually taking measures to reduce the carbon footprint. However, collaboration among them appears to be a challenge. Now I'll hand over to Veronique to speak about our case study outside of football. Thank you, Jacob. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to take you through all our question this findings, and you'll be amazed to find out the common emissions from other related events. Firstly, we love Green, a musical festival. We Love Green is a musical festival that held in Paris, France, that focuses on sustainability, co-eco-friendly initiatives, and, and going green. They implement several actions to reduce indirect emissions. Our research findings shows that 78% of festival goers come by public transport to musical festivals. The event organizers also achieve this through one, the festival ends early, therefore people must use public transport to find their ways home. Secondly, the festival organizers put in place no parking policy, which enable all or prevent all the fans going to the festivals using their own cars. Thirdly, they create a physical pace during the festival that encourage and educate everyone around sustainability. The second interesting article is the interested article is about the environmental impact of Hajj. The early 21st century, the international travel and religious tourism become a significant economic force with the world recognized impact. A great significant example is the pre-made to make a Hajj. Our findings shows that 87% of emissions are from air travel. In 2018, the holy city of Mecca hosted 2.3 million Muslims from 103 countries all over the world. The transportation impact of these visitors nearly, nearly cost 7,000 international, international flights and over 32,000 vehicles that used to transport people from the airports to the holy cities to perform the Hajj. Religious travel is among the ones that has a huge impact on destination ability to sustainable environment to reduce indirect emissions. And last but not the least is the case of Formula E. Formula E is a revolutionary motorsport championship that stands as the world's first fully electric racing series. They have, they have been committed to sustainability and become a net zero carbon sports. The estimated emissions from the fans' mobility represent only 4% of the total emissions received from each race. One of the most unique characteristics of Formula E is the cycle recreated inside the city centers, for example, the cities of London, New York, and Rome, which makes the events more accessible to all supporters. The championship also reinforces on the use of electric vehicles and also promotes sustainable travel practices among staff and members. Formula E is the leading example in the sport industry that inspires positive change. 
Their tangible and intangible programs provide valuable insights that serve as a role model for reducing farms travel and also such as to increase a more sustainable future. I will now hand over to Alex to take us through the conclusions and recommendations of our findings. Thank you. Thank you, Veronique. Good afternoon, everyone. Following what my colleagues just presented, we have set some recommendations for each stakeholders. As you can see, UEFA, clubs, and fans that they can embrace, obviously. These recommendations are designed to address a pressing issue, the need to reduce emissions generated by football fans. It is everyone's duty to make changes and to think on how to travel, and this begins by collaborating with each other. We must first avoid emissions, then reduce them, and at the end, offsets. Offsets should be the last option. And remember, small personal steps can have a huge impact. So starting with the first stakeholder, UEFA, the representative of the European football. UEFA, as a government body, holds a unique posi a position to implement significant changes. UEFA could consider adding sustainability as a mandatory licensing requirement by incorporating Article 31.2 to the mandatory requirement outlined in Article 7.1 of their club licensing and financially sustainability regulation. Bundesliga and Ligue 1, for example, already did it. This will ensure that clubs have a clear and long-term environmental strategy and being signatory of the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework, as so far only five clubs out of 48 signed. However, is it not enough to encourage and push clubs towards environmental care? More sanction should be enforced when clubs fail to make effort in reducing emissions. Finally, UEFA should also consider reviewing the competition from the design phase, without obviously impacting the core of the game. For example, reducing the number of the game. When looking at the newly announced format of the next UEFA Champions League competition, we can expect some increase in emission related to fan mobility. Regarding now uh, football clubs, they serve as the primary point of contact for fan mobility. They therefore have a pivotal role in reducing emission and transforming the way fans travel to stadiums. That is why clubs could invest in more organizational resources and sustainability teams, enabling them to implement tangible and intangible actions that minimize fan emissions. It will allow them to engage and educate better with the fans about those issues. One example, could be leveraging the influence of players and could have an effective way of shifting behaviors toward a more sustainable modes of travel. And finally, to facilitate sustainable travel for the fans, clubs should also collaborate with public transport or private transport companies in order to assist fans and propose alternative modes of travel. Finishing with the fans, which are the core of our research, they are the primary agents who must change their, mode, their travel mode in order to effectively reduce emissions. The power of fan activism during the Super League controversy clearly show how fans can make clubs change directions. They could put more pressure on clubs, leagues, UEFA, to effectively reduce those emissions. Fans group could also collaborate with each other to organize carpooling or any other lower emission travel mode. However, it is all about self-responsibility. According to the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, taking a train instead of a car for medium length distances would cut one emission by 80%. So we as fans must change our travel habits. Prioritizing the most sustainable way of transportation rather than the easiest one. While our research highlights some of the great work that's been done by clubs, leagues, and other industries to prioritize sustainability and mitigate the overall carbon impact of sports, the indirect emissions related to fan mobility continue to be overlooked. All of us in this room, as fans of sports, have a role to play and can make difference. So our question to you is, how will you travel to the next sport event you attend?
congratulations, group two, on your excellent presentation. I won't keep this, it's probably valuable. <laughs> and uh, it's now time for questions. Mr. Cornu. Uh, yes, uh, what about influencing the draw for the games in a way that would reduce the distance and make it possible, for example, for fans to travel by train? Uh, there could be possibly, uh, this could be possibly a way to reduce the emissions. Couldn't, have you thought about that? Is that part of your study? So thank you for the question. Um, it is actually about self-balance, as we mentioned. Uh, it is difficult to find a sustainable way um, for a competition without changing the core of the game. And so there's a rule during the stage that clubs from the same country cannot compete with each other. So this could be a rule that can be changed. But as Cheng Min mentioned earlier, fans sometimes don't want to uh, change those rules. And this is the complexity um, of the topic is changing rules without changing the core uh, of, of the game. But obviously it's uh, a recommendation that we thought about it um, and could be uh, more effective. Yes, we have a question. Um, second question for Simon. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for this presentation. I was wondering if um, you guys thought about perhaps uh, recommending teams to completely move to an online like watching setting. I think right now we're seeing you know social media taking a huge role in our lives. Everything is on the screen, and I was wondering if that was something that you thought about, and if you have any more thoughts on that. Thank you for the questions. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, had a chance to co uh, conduct interview with uh, Arsenal fan groups, uh, as well as Tottenham fan group. So from fans perspective, like since last two years because of the COVID, we experienced like watching footballs through online and things, but that's like additional things. They still want to see a football matches at the stadiums and their preferences is experiencing football in the stadiums and over the consider, uh, sustainability consideration. So this could be good options, but clubs should also think about like how can they reduce their emissions, actually the fans coming to the stadiums. Thank you. Question, Professor Bradbury. Thank Vice. you very much. Chancellor, I have to introduce you of the De Montfort University. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my understanding of what you're discussing is in other industries would be called scope three emissions, so the emissions that are in the influence of an organization but not directly. And very often there's huge debates about both the definition and ownership of scope three. So, for example, in the education sector, it's about international students and their travel and how much you know, they, CO2 emissions they, they emit. And there's huge debates about whether that should be included or excluded in a, in a university's carbon footprint. In the context of what you're talking about, is there the same debate about football clubs' emissions where they've committed to net zero like Arsenal or Forest Green, that scope three is within their ownership, or is it owned by the competition organizers, for example, in terms of their scope three emissions? And is that debate happening uh, in, in football? Uh, because that would be very interesting. And what would your recommendations be about who owns those emissions and what actions should be taken to reduce them? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, the greenhouse gas protocol scope one, two, three was a big part of our research and the football industry faces a lot of the same challenges in terms of who owns scope three, those indirect emissions. And um, what we learned was that setting up sustainability departments and taking actions towards carbon neutrality is still very new in the football industry. So right now they're more focused on things like waste management and energy and the indirect emissions that would fall under scope three is, is not being taken care of. And the Bundesliga is a great example of the league rather than the club taking ownership of that. And they published a study that 80% of the emissions produced by Bundesliga clubs are actually falling into scope three. And so I think our recommendation in terms of how clubs and fans can work towards uh, managing scope three emissions would be raising that awareness and, and letting fans know that their actions actually do have an impact on the club's ability to claim carbon neutrality. Um, so th the same debate is, is certainly going on in the sports industry. Okay, one, one more question, last one. Thank you, group. Oh, no, we will take, oh no, okay, well. I think we I'll can be very quick. We can manage. Maybe we can questions. get to. If my question is about media and sponsors, because you focused on three other stakeholder groups, and I would like to know what sense you have there could be pressure put from the media perspective, from the sponsorship perspective, who fund the entire football ecosystem. How could they potentially put pressure? I mean, you've, you've highlighted the role of fans, individual consumers, who could then send a message by saying, I'm going to, to operate differently. What is the role of media and sponsors in this? Thank you for the question, Kevin. So media and, and uh, sponsorships has definitely a role to play in, in solving this. What we've seen um, in our conversation with Fossil Free Football, which is focused on the sponsorship aspect in terms of putting pressure on um, carbon neutral sponsors and, and carbon free sponsors, um, it really is using frameworks that exist such as the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework or be corporation certified organizations to partner with uh, and sponsors and, and have as your sponsors. So um, we've seen a slight shift in terms of you know gambling and alcohol sponsors that have been moved out of the sport. And I think um, fans and clubs will require the same. We'll see the same trend uh, happen with more um, sustainable businesses and, and sponsors that are part of the game. Okay, now the really last question. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, guys, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Matteo, I work for uh, CIS. Mm, very quick um, question. In your opinion, and based on your research, what is the most important, the main barrier in the transition towards a more sustainable football events? Can you just repeat the last point again, please? Where is the most important barrier, the, the most important obstacle in this transition towards more sustainable football events? Thank you for, uh, for the question. So the first barrier would be um, definitely the, the means that clubs have um, in terms of um, gathering data or even implementing um, alternative modes of, of travel and fence behaviors as well, as we're talking about changing behavior, which is not um, easy. 
and also changing the competition because, as we said, the competition today um, is not uh, that sustainable. And I think this would be the most challenging part, changing the competition to a more sustainable way, as I mentioned, without obviously changing the core of the game and uh, the fans willing. Okay, well, you have done. Thank you very much. And now I invite group three to come on stage for their presentation. And you can start whenever you are ready. Somebody too. Good evening, everyone. My name is Renee, and these are my colleagues, David and G. And sitting in the audience is my son, Joe. <laughs> and Job absolutely loves football. In two years, he would be 13, and he would get, join an academy where he would get an opportunity to play more football. At that point, Job would then become part of the 100% of academy-level footballers who strive to become professional. During that process, many of these players sacrifice time, money, energy, and even sometimes their own education. They enter a lottery, but as Job's mom, should I place a safe bet? Because with all these sacrifices, there's no guarantee that Job may become one of these players. And while we may know who these players are, what do they all have in common? It is a fact that they make up the only 1% of players who eventually become professional. For example, in England and Argentina, only 0.5% of academy-level players make it a professional. In Spain, that percentage is even much less. Studies show that the average career of a footballer is only eight years, but still, 52% of them are forced into retirement simply, be simply because of injury or not having a contract. So what do you think happens to the other 99% of these players? Well, this is exactly what led to our research question. How can the football industry increase awareness of the importance of education in academy level footballers? Our rationale is due to the fact that the industry focuses on the 1% of these players while disregarding the rest. Additionally, academies are growing. There are more youth and professional competitions However, the professional market would not continue to absorb any more players. As a result, many of them would continue to get left behind. We also analyzed the testimonies of players who were released from academies and had, had significant emotional and mental effects. We also have personal experience of Jay and David who played professional and semi-professional football in their respective countries. They got to see how firsthand how their colleagues had to resort to odd jobs because when they were released from academies, they did not pursue any educational alt alternative. It is therefore important for us to address the questions the, and the concerns because as Job's mom, I definitely do not want that path for him. To answer our general research questions, we, we, the, we focus on understanding the reality of the football industry regarding education of academy-level footballers. For this to be achieved, we designed three specific objectives. One, to identify how the awareness on the importance of education for academy-level footballers can be increased. Two, to explore why education is an important factor for footballers at the academy level. 
and three, to identify which stakeholders hold the most responsibility within the education process for footballers within the academy level. To aid with our research, we incorporated a mixed research approach, including both quantitative and qualitative data. In relation to the quantitative data, we focused on the mass distribution of 211 surveys to the uh, FIFA's member associations. Of that sample, we had a successful 104 responses, which corresponds to 49.3% of our sample size, with CONCACAF, AFC, and CONMEBOL having the better success rate, as you can see in the graph. The survey was answered by the MA's presidents, general secretaries, head of development, or within the education department. From this impressive number of surveys, uh, the responses we received, we implied that the, the MAs have a vested interest in our research topic and its findings. In relation to the qualitative techniques, we had a vast number of in-depth interviews with 16 stakeholders within the football industry. They represent high-end executives from FIFA and FIFPRO, elite clubs such as Inter and Villarreal CF, general secretaries at various MAs, former players, coaches, consultants, among others. We had representation from different regions such as North and South America, the Caribbean, Europe, Asia, and Africa. This data gave us an understanding from their perspective across the world. We also incorporated bibliographical research to further strengthen our study. This helped us to successfully reach four outcomes, which are one, to increase awareness of the importance of education among academy level footballers, the clubs, the national associations, and the rest of the stakeholders in the sport. To demonstrate the positive impact that education can have in academy level footballers' future. Three, to define the responsibilities each stakeholder has regarding guaranteeing, providing, and demanding compliance of academics in academy level players. And finally, to develop a set of recommendations that can act as a future framework for the major sporting organizing bodies and national associations to incorporate high school education in academy level footballers. Now to analyze our research findings, I turn you over to my colleague, Jay. Thank you, Renee. After analyzing the collected data from both interviews and surveys, a notable finding emerged in our study highlighting the members associations as the primary entity to deliver with the highest degree of responsibility for education within the academy level football. Even more, this finding is further supported by the acknowledgement of the significance of education, even by the AMAs themselves. A survey response has shown that 89.4% of the MAs recognize the responsibility and the crucial importance of education in shaping the careers of academy level footballers. Nonetheless, recognizing the responsibility of education, we have also identified that 88.4% do not have existing data about the education status in club academies. From this study, we can assume that the importance of data is essential to understand how to increase the awareness of education and provide initiatives accordingly that should be further explored later on during our presentation. Moreover, our studies have also yielded significant studies, findings that only 31.7% of the AMAs has a mandatory high school education system. However, this study has also revealed that 53.8% of the AMAs say it should be mandatory to have at least a high school diploma becoming before becoming a professional player. The number corresponds to an increase of 22% from the reality to what they consider is ideal. While this project focuses on the academy level players, we also wanted to identify the positive effects of completing secondary education, which could lead to subsequent university registration. As a result, an overwhelming 87.5% of the MAs considered that professional footballers should pursue a university degree in order to create more opportunities for themselves towards their post-retirement careers. Subsequently, 80 out of 91 that responded have said that they should do it while playing. Beyond members' association's responsibility, we could also identify other potential key stakeholders that MAs believe should be held accountable in academic level education such as clubs and parents, uh, respectively coming second and third with most responsibility. 
Moving forward, uh, further to our qualitative interviews, we could also identify some good practices employed by the MAs and clubs. We would like to highlight some today. In England, an initiative knows, known as the Apprenticeship Program is provided with all, within all the professional football academies in England. This is a program where if a player reaches 16 years old, they will be offered an apprenticeship that has a compulsory education element to it. It is a recognized equivalent an A-level qualification that gives the possibility for footballers to matriculate to university. Moreover, the club must track and monitor post-apprenticeship destinations of the individuals for up to three years. In Argentina, a different approach study was analyzed. Compared to those in Europe, it allowed us to recognize the importance of understanding the cultural context of each region. An interesting initiative from Argentina was to promote education through the development of the intellect of a player. One recent initiative implemented was to present an education certificate once a player transfers or register, registers with a particular club. Also, even with the collective labor agreement of a football player, the, the players are entitled to an education. Overall, this allows the Argentinian FA to keep track of those who are being educated and, and for those who are not. At the club level, we identified Villarreal FC, a top tier club in Spain, with strong initiatives as well. An interesting finding is that, that the club at academy underwent a reformation structure in 2014, where they recognized the need to restructure the whole academy system to provide better education structures, both off, on and off the pitch. Currently, 18 tutors are available within the academy to supplement the players with all necessary academic, academic means. Additionally, the BRL FC model has become a brand value where it has attracted many interests from other clubs as well. Currently, eight out of 25 first team members players from the professional team are based from the academy. Taking all this into account is also important to highlight the significance of understanding the diverse education context of academic level footballs, footballers worldwide, particularly considering the culture variation with each, within each region. It is essential to acknowledge that the definitions of academic level football can encompass a broad spectrum on a global scale and definitions might vary. Based on the data collected in our study, addressing the topic of education within the football ecosystem is a complex matter. Stakeholders within the football ecosystem acknowledge the importance of education and its influence on the development of its academy. However, it is even more crucial to emphasize the importance of education and explore ways to increase awareness within the football ecosystem. It is vitally important to shift the perspective of viewing players solely as commodities and instead adapt a broader social responsibility within the football framework. And uh, as an additional study, we have, ident we have also identified the women's game, women's game is also facing an upcoming challenge. As the women football professionalism is, is increasing, there's already a noticeable decrease in educational levels in women footballers. We have to set an important standard for both men and women's football and protect the future of the academic level footballers. I ask everyone in this room, would you like to see Joe as a commodity in the football environment? I would definitely would not like to see that. In the following, we have addressed a set of recommendations and initiatives that should be further elaborated by David. Thank you very much, Jay. Based on what Jay carefully explained, we reassure ourselves that some global framework regarding education was needed. But we did not want to be self-righteous about it, so we went with what the world was telling us to do. In an overwhelming fashion, 99% of the MAs said that the world would definitely benefit from a global guideline regarding education. So the next step was developing that guideline. For that, first, we identified three pillars of needs. The need for data on the academic status of the youth players, so more analysis and initiatives can be created. The need for countries and their MAs to not just implement initiatives, but to report and comply to them. And the need for the participation of all the stakeholders in the industry to, in a joint effort with a meaningful goal in sight. Next, we identify an opportunity. With the re-election of Mr. Gianni Fantino as president of FIFA, a continuity to its agenda is guaranteed. And one of the positives of this agenda is that it has social commitments in it. For example, in the current cycle, 
from 11 pledges published, number 11 states a renewed commitment to social responsibility and global challenges. We have seen this opportunity blossom since FIFA Forward 2.0, uh, where the 11th goal was already to impact society through the power of football. And I quote, FIFA is dedicated to harnessing this power in order to have a positive social impact and address global challenges, contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And what a surprise, which is SDG number four, quality education. Then we also found this opportunity in FIFA Forward 3.0 that goes from 2023 to 2027. In this iteration of the program, a new criterion was created, which steps away from the strictly related football issues uh, that, that uh, are um, usually addressed, confirming that FIFA can worry about something else. It is worth 100 USD, uh, 100K USD per year if all variables are achieved, and it includes variables like safeguarding for children, equality, diversity, and inclusion principles, and environmental impact, just to name a few. The third aspect we identify in order to develop this framework were the differences between the football world regarding underdeveloped football countries and developed football countries. This means that we could not create a one-size-fits-all recipe. It's not fair, and it's not efficient. So we decided to create a strategy that can allow all MAs to implement initiatives according to their own possibilities, with, financial, uh, with um, substantial financial benefits and also that go along with the social gains of promoting education. For this, FIFA Forward is vital. Our recommendation hopes to be part of FIFA Forward 4.0, which aligns with the next four-year cycle of 2027-2030. We propose to create a 12th criterion called promotion of education, which will contain 13 variables and will be, up, will be worth up to 110K USD per year if all variables are attained. The amount is within range. To put, in, to put it into perspective, it's only 5.5% of the yearly budget of FIFA Forward 3.0. And if the budget for 2027-2030 increases as expected, this percentage will be even less. But after FIFA Forward, which is the collarbone of our, our strategy, there are also two other programs that are already running within FIFA scope that are key to us. One is FIFA Connect, which registers all the MA stakeholders, keeping track of players, coaches, referees, in a, in a unique FIFA ID code. It is a digital football passport with all the information of the history of the stakeholders. The other one is the club licensing system, which sets minimum standards that clubs must satisfy in order to get a license and be able to participate in given competitions. The idea will be that within the information registered in FIFA Connect, educational progress or regress for players 13 years older and up is added. Our KPI would be that 100 for 2027, 100 of, uh, of the players are registered in the system. And within the club licensing system, the idea would be that to receive the license, clubs have to add a student certificate for all the players stating in which grade they are in, in order to officialize the registration in the club. Our KPIs for 2027 will be that 100% of the data is collected, which will be already supported by the FIFA Connect strategy, but also that 85% of the youth players are still enrolled in school. In this latter variable, the KPI for every year will increase by 5%, so that at, uh, on 2030, 100% of the academy level players will be enrolled in school. Nevertheless, we understand that particularly these two items could be more oriented to bigger MAs, to top professional clubs, and also to well-established academies. Therefore, all the following items that you see on the screen should give the opportunity to MAs in underdeveloped countries to gain from the financial benefits of FIFA Forward 4.0. Some of them are developing a small survey for every youth player to discover special academic interests. The three-year follow-up mandatory uh, of the, the whereabouts a destination of the academics and um, professional destination of the players, regardless of being released from the academies. Also, the, the vocational workshops for 13 years old to 17 years old. The naming of a national ambassador that would promote education between this population. Ideally, a recognized player with academic success, for example, Giorgio Chiellini. Also, the naming, the appointing of players development managers at the MAs, the appointing of teachers as staff in clubs, and also the availability of e-learning platforms with courses for difficult subjects and also for learning some languages. All of this and a couple more touch all the stakeholders within our study, 
MAs, clubs, parents, governments, player unions, and of course, players. They also contain their own KPIs for the period from 2027 to 2030, and also the financial benefit that it will be earned if achieved. Everything is profusely addressed in our research paper, so we invite you, please, take a look to that too. We consider this strategy a well-rounded one that covers multiple areas that were mentioned by the stakeholders part of our study, and one that will be, ef that will be efficient and totally applicable if considered. However, we acknowledge, and this is in our conclusions, that it is highly dependent on FIFA. But as a mo the major organization of football in the world, with almost inexhaustible resources and the already explained intention to generate social impact, we hope that it can come to fruition in due time. To wrap things up, after hearing all of this, would you encourage this young kid to exclusively pursue a career in football, regardless of how good he can be, or would you encourage him to study while still playing? Would you push him into the lottery, or would you rather place a safe bet on him? After this presentation, I know that we all know the answer to this question. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Group 3, on your excellent presentation. I forgot to mention that the supervisor was Professor Dino Ruta, I apologize, Dino. And now we can move to questions. We have one from Professor Pauli. Thank, thank you, guys. Really enjoyed that. And well done, Joe, for your walk-on part. Um, I just really want a very simple question. I want to echo what Matteo just said just then. This is all fantastic. Fantastic scheme, KPIs, everything. But what's stopping it from happening now? What's the biggest barrier to these kind of changes happening right now? Uh, thank you for the question, Martin. Uh, first and foremost, there's no data. Uh, uh, MAs don't have data, clubs do not have data, and from that, it's very hard to create initiatives that are really impactful and, and can, be, can start changing. So what, that's one of, uh, of our main goals, to ask MAs to start producing this data. Also, uh, we cannot ignore this. There's a certain reluctancy of, of the industry because it's focused on the 1% of the players that, want, that need to get to the professional level so that uh, the system keeps going. So our, our idea is to, to change a little bit the, the approach and focusing more on the social development of the players instead of the only 1% of players that uh, can get to, to the professional level. Just to add to that very quick, uh, I think the data that we've collected is uh, some, I think, amazing results that uh, the number itself, I think, I th I be we believe that it doesn't lie. So the numbers create the awareness of, of uh, making initiatives accordingly. Next question, Professor Rigozzi. Thank you guys for this presentation. I must disclose that I didn't have the chance of reading your paper. So maybe my question is, it is stupid or irrelevant or, or both? But uh, I like programs, but I prefer mandatory rules that can actually uh, change behavior. So starting from the worrying figures, 1% uh, versus 99%, if I look at regulations, the RSTP concerns the 1% to actually transfer, uh, if I look at minors, right, to a professional contract. Is there any legal way to, to try to put some pressure uh, to make sure that the money that comes out from that 1% can somehow be used to make the life of the other 99% uh, better. Just thinking out loud during your presentation, I could think of giving training compensation or solidarity contribution only if you can prove that A, B, C, D, I don't know. Uh, but this is just the only thing I could 
come up with during this presentation. I don't know, maybe you, you, you have more on that. Uh, right now, there's no legal, uh, thank you for the question, by the way. Uh, there's no legal framework that can make this mandatory. Uh, I agree with you, I'll go completely on the mandatory side uh, of this to, to make this actually effective. There are initiatives from, from players. Uh, we, we researched some, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold has one uh, that he puts his own money to try to develop this uh, social eco educational side, but there's not much more than that right now. Any other question? I remind you that everybody in the room is entitled to ask questions, including the students, whether we have presented already or not. Professor Diaconu. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your presentation and congratulations on the subject. The topic was awesome. As a mom, I, I really appreciate it also. Um, my question is very simple and maybe it's also an ignorant question, but what is the role of governments to play in this? Because education is mostly the responsibility of governments, of, of public powers. So have you thought about how this can correlate with the FIFA's resources and availability to develop such programs? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the role of government, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the role of governments definitely is important, but it's not at the top priority of the football industry. But we, re when we did our research, we found some countries that actually uh, try to, um, to mix both of them. For example, we have Korea. Uh, Korea has a solid uh, framework regarding uh, student athletes and uh, their, their education policy, for example, they cannot play. They cannot play if they don't study. In Argentina, with this initiative, uh, they are doing the same. The government is uh, asking for the student certificates so that, that they can be allowed to play. There are some random efforts from the governments, but it's not a massive effort. But I agree. Uh, ministers of Education, Minister of Sport, should be part of any initiative. We try to, in our strategy. We try to. Uh, link some of the efforts, but the governments are the ones that should be more worried maybe about the growth on these numbers that we are showing right now, because there's a population that at the end of the day will go into the workforce, and if they are not capable, that will uh, go to another problem at the social level. So definitely they should be more, more active in this sense. Okay, we have time for one, for one more question, if there is one, and there is one. Thank you for your presentation, guys. Um, so I have a question regarding maybe if during your research you've been able to touch on the point of the importance of having an actual follow-up. Because, you can hear me? Because education is, education is one thing. You know, you offer education to players, then they make it or they don't make it. But then another important aspect of it is being able to help them and support them to actually turn into something more tangible in their life. Finding a job, pursuing maybe a higher education standards to find something that they actually want to do. So have you been able to talk about that? following up these athletes so actually whatever education they get they can actually use it in their life sorry can you repeat very, uh, again because we can we can hear you sorry so essentially have you through your research been able to discuss um, the fact that some players need to actually be followed after their career or even if you come out for the academy you have an education but then what happens next you know you might be lost you might need help to to, to find a job for example so the follow-up is actually necessary for maybe x amount of years is that something that you've been able to, to analyze in your research so 
so uh, as we discussed earlier, one of the uh, qualitative interviews that we had uh, is the uh, England FA, where they have a mandatory system where through the apprenticeship program, they must follow uh, post-apprenticeship uh, program up to three years. So that is one of the initiatives uh, that England is taking uh, currently in place. But that's why uh, we put that into perspective into our recommendations as well, because we consider it vital to really uh, collect data post-retirement uh, uh, in, in their football careers. Okay, thank you very much for all your answers. And now you all have deserved a break with some drinks outside. Uh, I would like to ask you to be back at uh, five to three. That means in a bit more than 20 minutes. Thank you very much for your punctuality.
time, we are going to start as soon as uh, the rest of the participants are seated. And I would like to invite group uh, four to come on stage. The supervisor in that case uh, was Professor Pierre Lafranchi. You can start whenever you are ready. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've had a good break. Um, before we begin, let me just introduce myself and my team. My name is Wan Sin, and I'm from Singapore. Over at the extreme end of the table, we've got Okena, who has roots in France, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, followed by Nicholas from Brazil and Poland, and finally towards me, Farid from Azerbaijan, and has lived in Italy for the last 12 years. So today is, is, is an extremely important day, not only because of the obvious reasons that has brought us into this room, but also because the best World Cup yet has just kicked off this morning. In this pivotal moment in time for women's football, it is relevant for us to take a closer look and contribute to the study of women's football. Therefore, today our group will present to you our research project entitled Overcoming Challenges, a Comparative Analysis of Professionalizations in Women's Football Leagues Among Top Nations. Before we begin, let me first explain what we mean by professionalization in this context. It is the process in which leagues become more structured and economically viable. Now that we are all on the same page, let me run through the flow of our presentation. So Kevin told us during our rehearsal that we might have broken the record for the longest findings and discussion section in our report. So please do not be alarmed as I bring us through swiftly the first three chapters before my teammates Okena and Nicholas complete the rest of the findings and Farid will conclude with our recommendations. Let's start with our research question. So we spoke about women's football earlier and in our early desk research, we noticed a trend in terms of the numbers of nations vying for a spot in the finals with just 44 MAs in the first edition of the 91 World Cup, to the staggering 172 in this year's edition. So we were curious to find out if this global shift towards increased interest and investment towards women international football also reflected in the domestic level. If we look at the host country of this World Cup, we already see a stark contrast in terms of league development. Just this morning, Australia and New Zealand just kicked off their matches and they both won, FYI. Australia has a fully professional league, whereas New Zealand has a fully amateur league. So, hence our research questions. Why is there a difference and how can this gap be closed? To answer these questions and have a more global understanding, we played to the strength of the culture and network diversity within our team and selected one nation from each of the six confederations. Based on these following criteria, data accessibility, international success, as well as any recent noteworthy league development. And the selected nations are United States, Brazil, Nigeria, England, Japan, and New Zealand. We also understood the complexity of the professionalization process. Thus, we identified and reached out to the various actors that have played a part in this process. So this table here shows 
the 19 actors who has agreed to an interview with us. Now for the interesting bits. We first investigated if the trickling down effect of international success applies to the development and professionalization of women's domestic leagues. That's Farid's babies, by the way. So we picked three case studies. The first one, women's, the US Women's National Team victory in the 99 World Cup. And 10 years after, Japan Nadashiko triumph in the 2011 edition. And finally, the recent victory for the England Lionesses in the Women's Euros. The 99 World Cup was described as a watershed moment for US women's soccer due to the cultural impact and the publicity it generated. Just two years after the victory, they established the world's first women's professional soccer league. But it folded just after three seasons on the eve of the following World Cup. The Nadashiko win came at a crucial time. The nation was still reeling from the devastation of the Great East Japan earthquake. And with the whole nation's eyes on the finals, the team's resilient display created a perspective change, such that it was no longer regarded as unusual for women to play football. However, during our desk research and interviews, we found, it, we found that there is common consensus that there was an incorrect assumption that there would be a natural sustained interest in the league, and that Japan had missed a golden opportunity to launch a professional league then. The upward trajectory of the England's Women's Super League is well documented. In our interview with Kelly Simons OBE, the FA's Director of Women's Professional Game, she highlighted that while the Euro's victory helped to showcase and attracted greater investment, this upward trend was already occurring, especially since the creation of strategic plans in 2017 and updated in 2021. The evidence gathered from these case studies highlights that while success on the international level can, prove, can provide temporary boost and increase attention, it does not guarantee the long-term development and professionalization. So what are the other factors and considerations in play? Please allow me to pass the time over to Okena, who will uncover them with you. Thank you, Sen, and good afternoon to all. So, as we've just seen, national team success is not enough to guarantee a successful and viable football league. And now, we will try and understand why the professionalization of women's football is at different stages in different nations, and what is currently done to close that gap. And to do so, I will take you through the impacts of the cultural and institutional factors. So it doesn't come as a surprise that cultural factors have come in as a hindrance for women's football. As you may all know, women's football has been banned in different countries, and even though that ban was not universal, women's football has faced a global ideological issue and barrier as to the fact that sport, football is seen as a, not, as, not seen as a women's sport. And so, additionally, some countries have their own specific barriers. Nigeria, for example, faces a religious barrier, whereby a low amount of clubs from the northern region actually play in the league. And in countries such as New Zealand, football is just not the most popular sport. The impact of public institutions furthers our understanding as to the gap in between the leagues. There's a clear difference in the implementation and efficiency of gender equality policies. Title IX in the US, for example, is a clear success story that allowed the growth and the professionalization of the NWSL. However, the enforcement of these policies is not the same in every country. There's also a difference in terms of political will and political environment, as shown by the WSL that benefits from a, the recent Finland review commissioned by the government that aim to improve the league's governance, structure, and the whole professional environment by sharing a set of recommendations. So now, let's try and see what is currently done to close the gap. And this is why we focus on football institutions, starting with FIFA, that launched a women's development program back in 2020. This development program allows MAs to seek for expertise and support through our different programs. So we focused on club licensing, given the important pillar that it is and the central aspect that it has in advancing the professionalization of football leagues. And our research has found that only 30 out of the 211 MAs actually enrolled in that program. So it obviously raises questions as to the low take-up rate, 
And we understand that better awareness and encouraging MAs to take part in this program will improve the professionalization of women's football and reduce the gap. Additionally, FIFA has been collaborating with more stakeholders, such as FIFPRO, as illustrated by the introduction of specific rules to protect women and female football players in the RSTP. And finally, FIFA has set Women's Football League based criteria to receive funding from the FIFA Forward Program, which is the main source of income and funding for MAs. Now, down to confederations. All our interviewees have actually recognized the necessity to work in a singular and tailored manner with each and every league to best support them. This shows that every league is different by their structure, by the landscape, and by their potential. Additionally, Confederations make use of continental club competitions as the main driver to raise standards through club licensing, to create financial incentives with prize monies and with solidarity funds, and to create prestige and value. And finally, the production of data-based elements. Sorry, the production of data-based documents, such as the UFA business case and the CAF Women's Landscape Report. This gives, a, this gives a clear overview of the professionalization of the women's game in a specific area, it highlights best practices, and it supports evidence-based decision-making. Now, when it comes to MAs, they have, sorry, they hold an important part in setting standards at an international level. They have the power, for example, to raise standards for clubs, by setting a club licensing system at a national level because they bear that responsibility, and they may also raise standards for players by setting regulations that tackle precarious employment, player welfare, and specific women-related issues. Women's, sorry, different MAs always also have the power to leverage international competitions. And the New Zealand Federation is a great example in the sense that it leverages international competition by, in, by implementing the development of the league in a wider strategy as regards to the Women World Cup legacy plan. And finally, improving the talent pipeline is an essential component, as displayed by the Japanese Federation, which has set a national training compensation system, even though there is no international training compensation system set by FIFA. Now, I will let Nicholas take the floor to lead us through our key findings. Thank you, Okena. So one of the biggest challenges right now for women's football is to balance growth and financial sustainability. And also, currently to the FIFA benchmark report, uh, the commercial stream is the most important revenue right now for the, for the clubs. So we decided to take a look on how the top of the pyramid of sports is working to maximize the revenue for women's football. FIFA already unbundled the Women's World Cup rights from the men's package. And UEFA did the same for the Women's Euros and the Women's Champions League. But what is happening in the domestic level? And that's what we try to understand here. So let's talk about how the actors are bundling its commercial assets to maximize their, their revenue. Uh, first, with, uh, I'm going to present two examples here. The first one in the US, where the NWSL signed up a partnership uh, with Nike to become a founding member of, of, of the league in 2012. And due to that, all the clubs um, are actually supplied, uh, have their kits supplied by Nike. And it, it actually shows that for such a long-lasting relationship, uh, the power of bundling and the power of a collective agreement. Um, the second case, it's in, the, in England, where all the clubs in the WSL are affiliated to a men's team. And, well, not only this affiliation continues, but all of them have the same kit supplier as the team they're affiliated with, and 83% have the same main sponsor. For last, 83% also have standalone Instagram accounts. Um, however, Man City is the only club in the WSL who actually have a shared Instagram account. Uh, as they say, it's part of this women's football strategy to have same passion and same city. So these two cases, uh, shows different ways of bundling commercial assets to foster financial sustainability. Now let's talk about unbundling of commercial assets with also two examples. Uh, the first one in the US again, uh, where four clubs out of 12 are affiliated with the men's team, and all four have standalone Instagram accounts and a different main sponsor from the men's team. In Nigeria, 12 out of uh, 14 clubs are affiliated to men's, yet only one 
had a main sponsorship deal uh, signed uh, for that season analyzed. Uh, trying to understand why is it the case, uh, not all the clubs have social media presence that you can see in the graph. Uh, those who have, they are not actually leveraging it. So since visibility is key in driving commercial revenue, uh, leagues such as the Nigeria one uh, have to believe that the lack of social media uh, is the reason why there is no um, uh, there is no interest from potential sponsors because, as you can see in the, in, the, in the graph on the right, only one club managed to sign a deal. But we decided to also see the considerations for bundling or unbundling. Um, so we also present the last two cases. Let's talk about my favorite one in Brazil. Uh, the vast majority of the clubs have a main sponsorship deal uh, for the season analyzed. Only Corinthians who, had, who has won the, the league three times in a row uh, and had the highest number of followers on Instagram by far within all the clubs analyzed in the country, they didn't have a main, spo a main sponsor for, the season, for that season. And at the same time, they said that they expect to break even by the next season, by 2024. So it makes us wonder, uh, how best can women's football be valued? And to wrap up, Japan. Um, over 50% of the main sponsors are local or regional brands. And at the same time, the majority uh, of them are supplied by a local or regional uh, manufacturer. At the same time, they signed a deal with Dazon, the OTT platform, who got a global uh, reach in a certain way. Um, but we, we start to see a kind of a dilemma for internationalization as the uh, we start to question, are the sponsors trying to reach an international audience, or is there a lack of alignment between the actors within that, uh, that country? Uh, in the end, the project is actually consistent, and there is a clean, clear uh, alignment among the, the actors, but we are still wondering what, what, what should, should they leverage the most? But perhaps the question should be about uh, if they should or not uh, bundle their assets. It's more about, first of all, understanding if, they, if, you, if you have leveraged the tools in order to maximize uh, the values of your assets, and analyze if you have understood the market you are operating in. Uh, only then you can develop a, a comprehensive commercial plan uh, for, for, your, for, for your following years. Um, to conclude, I'd like to invite Farid to present our final Recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas, and good afternoon, everyone. As you can see from the presentations of my colleagues who covered the impact of the national success in institutional and cultural factors and commercial considerations, it's evident that professionalization of the women football leagues is a complex in nature. So question, how can less developed leagues can bridge the gap? Drawing inspiration from the FIFA confederations and successful league organizers, our first recommendation emphasizes the importance of the comprehensive long-term strategic plans coupled with the targeted marketing and commercial strategies as demonstrated by the England WSL. Since every nation, clubs, and leagues has own distinct characteristics and faces own set of the challenges, it becomes imperative to adopt tailored approaches. In addition, fostering the competition, implementing the club licensing system, can incentivize them, establish better structure for their players. Finally, to use the criteria-based or area-specific mechanisms can channel their purposeful investment towards the development of the leagues. Our second recommendation is consistent data collection and report publication. In women's football, Implementing the regular data collection for benchmarking report, it's a vital and play crucial role addressing the challenge of inconsistent and incorrect data. 
by establishing standardized methodologies and enabling ongoing monitoring and evaluation, it helps to enhance reliability and validity of the information. While it may not completely eliminate the problem, but it significantly improves the quality of data, supporting evidence-based decision-making, and fostering deep understanding of the sports progress. These reports also serve a valuable resources for clubs and leagues for attract the potential investors. And finally, there is a need a proactive collaboration among the all actors to maximize efficiency and effectiveness to develop the process. Especially when it comes to the societal and cultural barriers, it's vital to strike the right balance between top-down and bottom-up approaches. During one of the interviews, I remember from the Angle City Football Club, Jacqueline, she stated, on the pitch, we may be the rivals, but off the field, we are united as a community. This emphasized our collective role in the journey towards the development of women's football leagues and promoting the globalization of the sports. As we conclude our FIFA master chapter here and embark on diverse roles within the sport industry worldwide, remember, you are the game changer. Join us. Let's make the Mark of Women's Ball together. Thank you. Congratulations, Group uh, 4, not only for the end of your presentation, but for the old presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interactive. And now we have time for questions. Uh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, I think there's a pretty general consensus among football fans that men's football today is too commercialized, that players are paid too much for what they do, that transfer fees are too high, reaching an unsustainable level, that fans are being alienated by decisions that are made with corporate sponsors rather than fans in mind. Uh, so my question is whether, given that you've identified that women's professionalization at this stage is highly contingent on high levels of corporate backing, uh, whether you've considered whether these problems might be reproduced in women's football and if so, how they could be avoided, whether women's football could present an alternative way of professionalization that doesn't reproduce these dynamics, or whether it's doomed to repeat them. Thank you for your question, it was great. Um, so you had a two parts question, really. So the first part you, you asked about um, the issue that there might be over commercialization in men's football. So if we look at women's football currently, one of the biggest issue that they are facing is financial sustainability. So we do not want to jump ahead of ourselves and consider over commercialization, but first we need to commercialize 
and create revenue such that women's uh, football can be sustainable and stable. So your part of the question is about whether there are other considerations to take women's football in a different path. In our research, we do realize that, especially in the unbundling process, women's football needs to, be, needs to be considered as its own product. And women's football right now is, is still very much a startup and investment. Um, Sorry, I, I, I'm trying to recall our genius earlier. Yeah, okay, my apologies. Um, so it must be considered its own product, and the unbundling process um, that we have seen in many clubs is, is just an evidence of that. And it is an extremely important consideration, and that is why we are actually included in our recommendations for future re research, to look at the definitions of success, and as well as the economics of women's football. I hope that answers your question. Cool. Next question. The Panther. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, my question, uh, I'm just interested in why you decided to frame your question around top nations and you didn't decide to maybe add one or two what maybe you'd consider underperforming nations as, as part of your comparison. Thank you, James, for the questions. Uh, as we stated in our presentation, that uh, the first, first the choosing the, these nations is, is important, their national success, that we can analyze the, of the paths they had in during this, from 1991 until the last World Cup today, they just kicked off. And secondly, also it's very important to access the data and it's very important that in women's football, for example, we had a limitation in Nigeria to access the, some of some some data. So, so th this is the main two factors that we decided with choosing these uh, six nations in each confederations. Okay, one more question. Uh, thank you for the presentation, guys. Just a question, if you've seen any trends in the type of companies or industries that have been commercially engaging in women's football in the, in the regions you identified. Well, thank you, thank you, Adele. Um, we did actually see, uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, I think five out of the 12 teams have a main sponsor that comes from the healthcare industry, which is something that we actually digged in, into our paper. And there were also some other trends uh, in other countries, um, in Brazil with gambling and financial services. Uh, I mean, if you take your time, it's there are some more inputs there, but thank you, thank you very much. Okay, unless there is still a burning question.
um, my question is, uh, you guys were talking about women's football on an international level, but have you guys looked at women's football on a community level or um, yeah, on a community level? And because uh, you know everything starts at a foundation. So if you if you guys looked at it, let's say for example in the community of Neuchatel. Like, what ways can you improve from the community? Because, you know, everything starts from the community, and that's where you're going to get persons to get to play internationally. And my next question is, what examples or what... Okay, so what um, examples can you take from men football? That be, men football is successful. So what examples can you take from men football to introduce it into women's football to make it successful? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so to answer your first question, the first part of the question, so we did try to more or less tackle these, um, this question by analyzing the current barriers, let's, let's say cultural barriers, for example, that, that brought certain female players to the top level. But I have a one key aspect and one key finding is our research is that there are still a lot of things to be explored in women's football. And I definitely, that the, this point that you mentioned is definitely one of them. As to the second question, um, we believe that female football should be its own product. So it can find some inspiration from men, but it should not be referenced as the core reference. However, one key thing that we could point out, for example, is why is there no international training compensation system? So there's an interesting debate around this as to, for example, training compensation system might not actually the best way to develop players because now that you incentivize them with money, it might lead them astray to what actually you want to, to convey through, through, through football for women. So that's an, inter an interesting topic and an interesting debate. Okay, thank you very much. Time is over. And I invite group five to come on stage. Take your seat. I was the supervisor of this group, so I take the responsibility. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Thank you for joining us today as we present evaluating the significance of ethical codes regarding integrity violations and their growing relevance in the realm of sports, an exciting exploration into sports ethics. My name is Eugen, and today I have with me Altaf, Mario, and Amobi. We are confronted once again with the disheartening and alarming reality of continued abuse inflicted upon athletes, leaving us shocked and disappointed. Canadian gymnast Ryan Sheehan's statement particularly well addressed this issue. He claims, I was abused in sport, but broken by the system. It serves as a powerful outcry, shedding light on the systematic issue of this nature. The breach of trust has led to widespread skepticism and a demand for accountability and ethical reform within sports organizations. Ethical violation cases involving athlete integrity can be divided into the following two distinct categories. First, there are cases where the athletes themselves fall victim into the abuses, such as sexual, physical, and verbal mistreatment. Secondly, athletes can also become perpetrators themselves, engaging in unsportsmanlike behavior, bullying, tarnishing the reputation of the sport, or even participating in match fixing themselves. Both categories significantly harm the very essence of our sports and our organizations. And for those curious about the intriguing title of our presentation, Slicing the Onion, it originated from a captivating discussion we had while studying the realm of sports ethics. As we unfolded and delved deeper, we discovered the numerous intricate layers that exist in violation and sports integrity, much like peeling an onion. Each layer revealed another layer, and though not always pleasant to confront it, it was a necessary task we had to undertake. And one major part of reform strategies are revising one's ethical codes. There's an increasing adoption of ethical codes amongst almost every federation, which highlights their growing relevance. And thus, we have chosen ethical codes as our starting point and tool to unravel the complexities of sports ethics. An ethical code is a comprehensive and official document outlining the guidelines for ethical conduct among athletes toward organizations, stakeholders, and society at large. It is like the holy bible of ethics in sports, guiding individuals what is acceptable and what is not. In the sports realm, however, their efficacy still remains uncertain and understudied, necessitating an examination for their purpose and measurement. Thus, our research objectives encapsulate what we aspire to present to the guests today as well, and has been our guiding life for research. First, we attempt to understand the systematic problems that exist in athlete integrity violation. Second, we analyze the role of an ethical code in these cases. And third, we attempt to identify how an ethical code can be made more effective. Our research methodology encompasses of diverse data collection, including qualitative and quantitative resource with an incorporation of di different theories such as the ethical climate index, con content quality approach. We also examined 37 different international federation codes to identify common themes and patterns. Then we moved on to a focused analysis of four athlete integrity case violations through a lens of ethical codes. And finally, we conducted expert interviews who currently work in the sports of, in, in the realm of integrity fields, which confirmed many of our findings. As previously mentioned, comprehending sports ethics and its intricate nature can be very daunting. To navigate this complexity, we have employed the code determinants framework as foundation for unraveling the layers of an ethical code. So in the following presentation, we will guide you through each layer, shedding light on the potential loopholes that exist. And I'll start with code creation. During our research, a crucial discovery emerged during the code creation stage, highlighting that relying on a Band-Aid approach in addressing ethical violations is frequently inadequate in terms of sanctioning and holding accountability. 
And this can be well exemplified by the two notable match-fixing scandals during the 2012 London Olympic Games. While the badminton scandal on the left exhibited a more overt intensity in terms of match-fixing, it is intriguing to observe that these two cases resulted in contrasting verdicts. One was duly sanctioned, while the other was cleared of any wrongdoing. This begs the question, what factors contributed to such divergent outcomes? And the key to understanding this disparity lied within the code creation itself. While one case had an explicit mention of the misconduct within the code, the other case did not. The Badminton World Federation had in its clause, as you, as you can see on your left, a failure to play one's best effort clause within the code. It is, however, important to acknowledge that ethical codes cannot anticipate every potential instances of misconduct as their occurrence and predictability vary across different sports. These incidents were more vulnerable to badminton tournaments, where at the time was relatively unforeseeable in football tournaments. Nevertheless, this highlights the importance of regularly revising these codes to adapt to evolving challenges in mind that there cannot be a this does not happen to our sport type of approach. I will now pass on to Altaf, who will unravel the next layer of our ethical codes. Thank you, Eugene. Ladies and gentlemen, to fulfill the moral aspirations of Olympic movement, it becomes crucial to ensure that the conduct of athletes, coaches, and other stakeholders align with ethical codes. We need to keep in mind during code content stage that sport is unique as an entity. It differs significantly from other business-related codes due to varying factors like low degree of product sustainability, high degree of media involvement, the loyalty and passion of fans, and the specificity of stakeholders' involvement. As Eugene said, when, when we analyze 37 IEC recognized federations integrity code, common themes which emerge like fair play, honesty, equality, dignity, safeguarding, human rights, respect for diversity, children's rights, physical and psychological inter integrity, inclusion, confidentiality, objectivity, conflict of interest, and social values emerge from these codes. These notions form the bedrock of, of ethical behavior in sports. We identified key nine areas to take away at the content stage. Number one is dentological versus consequential statements. Ethical codes lean towards dentological phrasing, emphasizing obligations and rule to follow. However, a balance is needed with consequential statements where outcome of action is major concern rather than means and intent of athlete sect. It will prescribe a certain behavior and rational for the sect. Consequentialist and virtue ethics rarely applied in the field of ethical codes, indicating a potential area for improvement. Number two, tone of the code. The tone of the codes also matters. Some codes have inspirational tone, guiding stakeholders towards ethical conduct, while others have more regulatory and prescriptive in nature. The tone, whether positive or negative, play a significant role in conveying the mood of the message. A code should not be a dry set of rules, but a source of inspiration stimulating moral awareness among stakeholders. Number three, length of code. There are also variations in code length, with some being too long and others too short. This discrepancy, discrepancy often leads to hollow phrases. We must strive for vivid and impactful instrument that capture the essence of ethical behavior. Number four, involvement of stakeholders. It is necessary to involve all relevant stakeholders and their input may be considered as an important feedback regarding the content of the code. Number five, themes of the code. It is observed that themes like fair play, honesty, often dominate the codes, while others such as well-being of young athletes receive less attention. It, it is vital to address these areas. There is also need for clear guidance on how to behave ethically in specific situations. Incorporating illust different illustrations and examples along with inspirational elements will encourage relevant stakeholders to behave ethically. When it comes to challenging to anticipate any professional potential issue, code should also contain general wording alongside specific provision to cover unforeseen violations. Number six, code revision and updation. 
Technological advancement also demand our attention. For example, cryptocurrency can also be a mean during integrity evaluation. Therefore, it is crucial to mention these things within the code's content and regularly update the codes to address emerging technological and other challenges. Number seven, applicable persons. There is also the need for codes to extend beyond the protection of sport itself and focus on safeguarding the integrity and well-being of the people involved in it. Number eight, responsibility of authority. It is crucial to explicitly mention that role management and outline specific elements regarding their conduct. This ensures that the actions such as involving doping violations are not overlooked and only the athletes should not be blamed. Number nine, specificity of sport. For example, if you look, if we analyze three different sports that in gymnastic, because athletes start from a very young age, so there is risk of sexual harassment. And if you go, for example, about weightlifting, there is a risk of doping. And in cricket, there is chance of manipulation either individually or as team. So there should be need for the specific, needing specific vulnerabilities to create codes regarding these, these games. Let's embrace the power of well-crafted code of ethics and strive to preserve the integrity and value that makes sport such a cherished part of our society. Now I would like to invite Mr. Mario Pagano for next stage code implementation. Thank you very much, Altaf. So the code implementation. We conducted uh, several interviews. We picked five of them. Uh, they had different backgrounds. We had somebody from the IOC, somebody from the British Olympic Committee. We also had some lawyers. And what we can notice is when we look at the code implementation, the code implementation, the factor communication, everybody of our interviews agree that it's one of the main factors. Why is this the case? When it comes to communication, it's important that the internal and the external uh, stakeholder communicate with each other. So a code implementation is not there to punish somebody, but it's there to improve. So in further future, also to have some kind of good governance, some mechanisms which control that uh, this abuse or the breach of code of conducts does not happen. Other important factors are obviously also um, ethical leaders and the values itself. So when somebody has a question, it can also be a coach or an athlete, he can look, he can ask, uh, how does this ethical code work? He can inform himself, the, there are workshops or there is maybe a hotline, so uh, he knows how the rules work. By looking at cases, we picked uh, three cases. So the first two cases, so case one and case two, are more athlete-based, whereas the third case it's more based about somebody who was in the Federation itself. So the first case, we're looking at Ryan Lochte. He was an USA uh, swimmer, uh, Olympic swimmer. In 2016 in Brazil, he claimed he has been uh, attacked and that a gun was pointed at him. However, it came out that he and some of his friends uh, destroyed a gas station. He got then sanctioned by USA Swimming. And what is the interesting factor behind it? So normally, when we think about ethical codes, we think that an ethical code only comes into place when there is abusement or sexual harassment. However, in this case, it came or it was used because the, the athlete itself was not, uh, was not a role model or he was going against the principles of the Olympics, which uh, are like fairness and being also a fair sportsman. The same happened in the second case with Hugo Gasto. So Hugo Gasto, during a tennis match, he threw in a ball, and due to ATP rules, the game got then cancelled. So therefore, he got also sanctioned with a fee and disqualified. And here we can also see that fairness in sport is a very important factor. Looking at the third case, the third case is a little bit different. It's like a classic case of uh, abusement of an ethical code. We're talking about Larry Nasser who uh, was uh, in the Gymnast Federation, American Gymnast Federation, and he, over several years, he uh, sexually harassed uh, minors, uh, and the Federation defended him for a long time. So therefore, 
uh, also the Federation uh, got on the fire and now he's serving a sentence in prison. And uh, I will continue with Amobi who is going to talk about our code enforcement. Thank you, Mario. In slicing the last layer of our onion, your onion, we shall look at code enforcement, our findings, recommendations, and our conclusion. We have seen the process of code drafting, its content, and the process of its implementation. Now, we look at another vital component in the life wire of codes, enforcement. The enforcement stage of a code is undeniably a crucial aspect of its establishment. Without proper detection and sanction for code violations, the ethical code runs the risk of becoming a mere useless and neglected instrument. Well-defined and communicated sanctions serve as a deterrent and reinforces the importance of adhering to ethical codes. Hence, organizations need to not only develop comprehensive codes of ethics, but also establish a robust and practical approach towards the enforcement of ethics throughout the entire organizational structure. It must be noted that even though ethical code violations fall within the enforcement purview of private law, because it raises questions and are resolved within the internal system of the International Sporting Organization, there exists an interrelationship with public law, wherein certain issues of ethical violations would invoke the machinery of the state, like the police and other law enforcement agencies of the state, as was highlighted in the Larry Nassar case by my colleague, Mario Pagano, a man who assaulted over 256 girls and women for 18 years people kept under his watch. Now, let us for once pause and ponder what the effect would be if ethical codes are not enforced. Our athletes, our children, the future of the unborn, the very delicate nature of sports would lack protection and mere anarchy would be let loose upon the surface of the world of sports. To properly enforce code of ethics, it must be noted that a proper and effective channel for communicating cases of violations becomes inevitable. We note, however, that the enforcement of the letters of code of ethics and not without certain legal limitations, ranging from due process or lack of it to the bureaucratic and somewhat dependent judicial framework within the organization. Therefore, it becomes a great limitation where incidences of violations cannot be implemented due to certain intentional and unintentional clogs in the wheel of progress of efficacy of codes. As Christopher Ere so gently puts, when law enforcement fails to fulfill its most basic duty to protect and serve its citizens, particularly members of a minority community, it not only tarnishes the badge we all wear, but erodes the trust that we in law enforcement have worked so hard to build. Our findings reveal that ethical codes go beyond mere words on documents. It is a comprehensive and intricate framework 
that demands the active involvement and commitment of all stakeholders, you and I, and every member of this team. Therefore, for a comprehensive ethical code regime in sports, each part of the layers above must function together. Otherwise, the system breaks. We know that it is challenging, but we also observe in the course of our studies that we can strengthen the layers one step at a time. Education, ethical leadership, clear content, safeguarding, which is the in thing right now because you find that some organizations are now beginning to flash their torchlight on the issue of safeguarding. Strict enforcement involving stakeholders. Back to you and back to group five as well. Proper communication and reporting mechanisms. In making our recommendations, we note that the changing tides of today's world necessitated by the growing dynamics of technology opens another vista of thought on the question of ethics. Ethical codes therefore need to constantly adapt to current trends. For instance, cyberbullying, online harassment, and acceptance of cryptocurrency for manipulation of results. And we recommend a more proactive approach towards the ethical code question. And we recommend a more proactive approach towards the ethical code question, considering new innovations in technology and the impact of social media in today's world. We observe that questions concerning ethical codes are not always on the front burner in international organizations, especially in sports, and are mostly categorized as secondary issues. Whereas, in the grand scheme of things, ethical codes and the need for conscious knowledge of its existence, implementation, and potency should be the duty of all and sundry within the sporting ecosystem. Conclusively, distinguished professors, fellow colleagues, their family and friends, those watching online, as you live here today, think of the world of sports without the vital potency of ethical codes. Think of the future of sports. Think of the vision of the first inventors of the various sports we enjoy and their ultimate desire to make sports purified. Think of athletes molested as a result of lack of codes or its enforcement. And I bet, we bet, you will agree with group five, that this onion we have sliced pleads for attention, its voice reverberating around all corners of the world, asking for sports world, asking for the entire world to treat it with all sense of seriousness and responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Group 5, uh, on your excellent presentation. Congratulations. So now we have a short time for questions. Professor Rigotti. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation here. Again, I must confess that I did not have the opportunity to read your uh, paper. So my question is based on your, on your presentation only. I was wondering in your, whether in your, let's say, onion peeling process, you came across the CAS award in Jean Bart versus FIFA, and uh, what federation can learn from that award? Sorry, which case? Jean Bart, the former president of the AIT turn, Federation. Turn your, yeah, just. Yeah. Yeah. 
Did you, did you get me? Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Um, we did not look at that case, but we also looked at a similar case where we found that in Afghanistan, the former football federation president um, of Afghanistan uh, was molesting and forcing himself and sexually ass assaulting a, um, young women playing for the federation. But what we found from all this remains the predominant position of sports federations over its athletes. And we advocate for a review for the creation of balance. And you find also that because of the internal judicial system, which is somewhat not independent, it raises a serious question. But this particular case, we did not look at it. Yep. Thank you so much for the very interesting topic. Uh, my question is basically about the cases where there is an unbalanced power dynamic between the abuser and abusee, not only in the field of sport, but in any organization, this is going to be a problem. Whatever the code of ethics is there and uh, however you uh, try to enforce it, there is going to be this problem. I just wanted to know if you have considered that sort of problem, and if yes, what is your solution uh, to that problem? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. So you asked whether there are cases of imbalanced power amongst the, 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 whether the perpetrator or the... Uh, okay, so if I may clarify the cases where there's an unbalanced power within the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So we did look into some cases where the victims of athletes had very little uh, had very little sources to whether it be reporting, whether it be safe whistleblowing, or whether it be uh, having an integrity hotline or other uh, people within the federation or outside being there for the help. So we think that especially in the code determinants that we have identified, first of all, uh, from our findings with the interview, interviews with the lawyers as well, that's why it is important to first of all, have it very specifically mentioned within the code so that it becomes basis for the abused to, uh, to, file, a sanction, to file a case against that but also within the different layers that we have examined to further strengthen, whether it be the reporting mechanisms or um, integrity hotlines for the power imbal the person with the less power to uh, resort to more methods to help safeguard the person. Um, if I may add something, when such a cases happen, often there is not a clear ethical code. So ethical codes often get introduced after such a case. So, um, for example, after Larry Nasser case, uh, in the code there, got, there was a new regulation that a minor cannot be alone with an adult anymore, so there always needs to be two adults. And that's a little bit the problem with the code of ethics. So they often happen after already something happened, and do we want uh, to have the code of ethics already there before something happens? You can never prevent anything for 100%. But it gives, if you have more stricter guidelines, uh, less cases will happen. Okay, Professor Pauli. Thank you. Thanks, group. Um, my question is about, I guess, the mixed messaging and possible conflict of interest between expectations on players and the needs of commercial interest in sport. Uh, I'm obliged to ask this question as a Brentford supporter, right? You can see this coming. So our star player, Ivan Tony is currently serving a long ban for over 200 cases of betting on football. And yet the shirt sponsor he's been wearing all last year, all this year, is a betting company. So he's being punished for an activity that when he plays, he is advertising. 
I think it's right that he's being, being banned. I, I have no problem with that. But I do think it raises interesting questions about the ethical behavior expected of players and the commercial interests involved in the game. And I think Ivan Tony is a nice case study there. I'd be interested in your, in your view on that, maybe um, mixed messaging and conflict of interest. Thank you so much. Um, first, issues of betting, we know is prohibited for people who have direct influence in sports, and we know that the Macaulay Convention came to stop some of these issues. Now, when you come to the commercial aspect of this, if you recall in our slides, we had about eight layers where we spoke about safeguarding and education and the rest. Safeguarding becomes of paramount importance because most times you find that when you represent these players when they have been indicted, they tell you, and sincerely, they don't know about the clauses in these regulations. So education is one, and then the concept of safeguarding is another. And we are happy to say that the concept of safeguarding is really improving day by day. And I think our thought on your question would be that for the future, we hope that we will see a more improved system. Thank you. OK, I think the time is over. So, so thank you very much once again. <laughs> we have planned in the program a short Please be back uh, 10 past uh, 4 on your seat. Thank you very much.
to keep the time. We will start in two minutes. Okay, now we proceed with the last two groups. And I will give the floor now to group six. Thank you for having been patient. And uh, I wish you good luck and I give you the floor. Good afternoon and thank you for being here today. We are very excited to present to you our final project. Our group includes Twale Charles Ajia from Nigeria, Ahmed Gobran from Egypt, Nihan Jabrolo from Turkey, and myself, Byron Me from the UK. We would like to begin with a quote that came in an interview that we conducted by the executive producer of Welcome to Wrexham, Jeff Luini. When we asked him what his vision was when it came to producing Welcome to Wrexham, this was the answer that he gave. He said, why do I watch sport? I watch it because someone is going to cry. It's dramatic and it's unscripted. The winners are going to cry out of joy the lo and the losers are going to cry out of sorrow. That's what I love about sport. This quote resonated with us because it shows the level of emotion that can come with sport and docuseries can harness this emotion whenever they wish, unlike live sporting events which might just come once at the weekend. We wanted to see how this power that sport and the emotion it can bring out in people can be used in docuseries to benefit football clubs. This leads to our research question. More than simply entertainment, an explorative study on the impact of docuseries by professional football clubs in the UK and analysing their potential as a viable marketing tool. This is what you can expect from the presentation from my colleagues and myself today. I will begin with some context and highlight the importance of OTTs to sports docuseries. And then my colleagues will delve into the research design, findings, opportunities and challenges, and finally the commercial viability of our topic. If we begin with some context. In only a short space of time, OTT platforms have gone from being a form of content largely unknown to becoming really the primary source for viewing entertainment for a lot of people. 
Due to factors such as high subscription costs that can come with using paid, multi-channel TV and year-long contracts that can be hard to get out of, people have begun to cut the cord in favour of OTT platforms. OTT platforms such as Netflix, Amazon Prime Video and Disney Plus offer a viable solution for people. Often, the subscription rates are lower and more reasonable and the contracts aren't so binding for such a long period of time. When it comes to sports docuseries, this move by people from paid multi-channel TV to OTT platforms was a significant breakthrough. This is because on paid multi-channel TV, sports docuseries did not gain much airtime. TV commissioners had limited slots and prioritised other forms of entertainment which they deemed more entertaining. However, when it came to the rise of OTT platforms, roughly 10 to 15 years ago, a considerable amount of content was needed to keep up with the rising level of demand from people cutting the cord. Sports docuseries were included and a new home for this form of content was found. Without owning sports rights, the next best option was sports docuseries. Platforms realised that if you can gain access to teams or individuals with interesting stories to tell, sports docuseries can be relatively straightforward to produce. Furthermore, not only were they far cheaper than bidding for sports rights, but they also attracted a similar audience and demographic to the platform. In recent years, as this slide shows, a variety of clubs from across the UK have produced a docuseries. These docuseries have aired on platforms I've previously mentioned, such as Netflix, Disney, and Amazon Prime Video. As we can see through the likes of Sunderland AFC and Wrexham AFC, these docuseries are not necessarily restricted to clubs in the top league of the footballing pyramid in the UK. Clubs across several leagues has produ have produced one. As my colleague Nihan will explain next, with the success of sports docuseries such as Drive to Survive in Formula One, it might not be so surprising a variety of clubs such as these are looking to produce this form of content. Over to you, Nihan. Thank you, Byram. Uh, we know that like, now that we have context, I, we are sure that when we talk about sports docuseries, a lot of people tend to think about Drive to Survive because it was so successful that, has, that Drive to Survive has set a very high benchmark for the sports industry. So where does the success of Drive to Survive comes from? We indicated there is a uh, two reasons why Drive to Survive was so successful. Firstly, it increased attendance to the races, especially in the United States. After docuseries, Austin, Texas race broke record with 400,000 attendants. And one third of those people who attended the race said that they came to see Formula One after they watched the docuseries. The other one, why Drive to Survive is so successful, is that it captured younger audience which sports industry is always hungry for. And it came at the time that Formula One was not cool enough. It uh, resonated with lots of young people and they started following Formula One. So this is a very successful docuseries. But is it achievable for the football clubs? That was our question. This is such a high benchmark that how can football clubs and football harness the power of docuseries? So to find out, we designed a research. Uh, we narrowed the territory down to United Kingdom and we picked six popular docuseries to concentrate on. These are three all or nothing series, which includes Arsenal, Manchester City, Tottenham Hotspur, Sunderland till I die, Take Us Home, Leeds United, and Welcome to Wrexham. These are different football, these are related to different football clubs from different leagues and from uh, different OTT platforms. So, and then we went to the fans, and then we tried to understand the impact of it. So what is so powerful about this docuseries that people are tuning in and watching and recommending to other people? We designed a fan survey, and we asked the fans how did they feel after watching the docuseries. And then we chose two case studies. We focused on All or Nothing Arsenal and Welcome to Wrexham. These are two different clubs. One is at the Premier League and it's an, and, uh, it's an established brand with lots of global fans around the world. And Wrexham, a small Wales town, 
nobody was heard of before. But after the docu-series, they are now, the players of the Wrexham are now superstars. And we went to the stakeholders in the industry, we went to the clubs, we talked to stakeholders, we conducted interviews, and then uh, we uh, achieved some results. Now uh, we will talk to you uh, about our findings within the survey. So let's start with the fan survey. We went to the fans. We had uh, 273 people responding to our survey. It was a global survey that was online. And uh, the, the respondents were 88% male and 75% uh, were representing generation Y and Z. So it was widely a uh, male, younger audience. Uh, as you can see on the map, these are where respondents are from. So it's, the respondents were not from the UK, but other countries like Egypt and Turkey. Uh, wonder why? <laughs> because of the researchers' nationalities, of course. So is it, do you see it as a, a bias to our project? Maybe, but maybe there's an opportunity that is lying here, which brings us to our findings. So. One of the findings that we have is um, we asked the fans, did they engage more in club social media after watching the docu-series? 20% said that yes, they do. After watching docu-series, they started following more of the relevant club social media. Second, 20, near 25% said that they, after watching docu-series, they started to follow live matches more. But the last two findings are the opportunities. As you can see, 60% of the respondents said that after watching docu-series, their interest level for the club has risen. And 65% said that they have more emotional, co emotional uh, contact with more great, <laughs> I'm sorry, so 65% said they had greater emotional connection with the relevant club after watching the docu-series. So remember the bias that we talked about. These respondents are not from the UK. They are from other parts of the world. So which makes it very interesting because they're watching a docu-series about a football club in the UK and they have greater emotional connection. And we found the first opportunity lying here, which is enlarging to new territories. And my colleague Ahmed will talk you through that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As my colleague Nihan was explaining moments ago that fans outside the UK felt more attracted and attached to the clubs after watching the docu-series. In our case study of Wrexham AFC, who produced Welcome to Wrexham case study, uh, case, uh, docu-series. To give you more context, uh, two Hollywood superstars, Warren Reynolds and Rob McElney, bought the club uh, two years ago to produce this docu-series, and one, what happened after, it transformed the whole club. We can see here, United Airlines are the sponsor of the front uh, jersey of the club. Last year it was TikTok, they have Exhibitia as well on the back of the jersey. Also, as quoted by the club football secretary, Jerem Barry, who we conducted an interview with, he said that eight of every 10 uh, club merchandise sold online are going to North America. To give you more context also about the club, Rixham, it's a National League club. They promoted this year. The National League is considered the fifth tier in the English football pyramid. <coughs> Still with our uh, Rixham case study, the Doki series, it doesn't have only impact on the club, but it exceeded that to the city itself. The city economics, it changed after that as we spoke with the football club secretary, and he said that you can now hear American and Australian, even Brazilian accents within the club shop and the city center. It will be normal to hear nowadays. The city became a tourist attraction after producing the docu-series. Also on the individual side, there is a famous bub that where Ricks and fans were gathering, and you can see here the club, the Bob owner is being interviewed by the Daily Mail after having all these Hollywood stars coming in. And we also can quote here the Jeremy Barry quote that he told us, there will be every day three buses full of American tourists 
wanting to get into the pub. So moving to our next case study, it's Arsenal, or nothing. And here we ask ourselves a, a question. Does it impact only the financials and the social part of the club? No, it went more than that. As reported by Aaron Ramsdale, the English goalkeeper of the club, who said that in last May, before playing Newcastle, the manager, uh, Mikel Arteta, he showed the players in his pre-talk before going to the match clips from Arsenal or Lassing last season when they lost against Newcastle. And he said to them that, do you want to look like this after today's game? You have to play more and give more on the pitch to, in order not to be like this. And luckily, Arsenal won that game 2-0 and everyone was happy. And this shows the, um, the impact that the Dukya series can capture within the dressing room, the emotions, all the things that you cannot see within the 90 uh, minutes airtime on the ordinary channels. Also here days ago, uh, the English star Declan Rice, who signed for Arsenal, he stated in an interview with The Athletic that one of the things that influenced him to join Arsenal, that he saw all or nothing, and he observed how Arteta is dealing with the team, the team dynamics, his aspirations, his project. So now we can see if you did a, a good uh, docu-series, you can bring a lot of stars to your team. Uh, and at the end, we interviewed Tim Payton, who is the board member of Arsenal Supporters Trust, who said that the atmosphere within the stadium and the fans, it changed it to be more positive and more warm, which helped Arsenal this year to compete for the league. They came in second, and then they will play in the Champions League for the next years. So after my three slides, we can ask ourselves, is it all positive like this? So if it's that pos positive and giving you all of these opportunities, why doesn't every club around the globe is doing one? This is a really good question, and my colleague Tuali will answer it. Thank you, Ahmed. Good afternoon, everyone. So we all know not all love story has a happy ending. There are challenges, such as the same case with Docker series. One of these challenges we found from our research is the cost. The cost of, get, of doing the, conducting the Docker series is really, really high. First, you have to acquire the technical expertise and the equipment. Then you have to move the logistics team and production crew from one end of the country to the other for a year or perhaps more or perhaps outside the country. Further to that, gaining match footage is really expensive, as we are told by the executive producer for Welcome to Wrexham, Jeff Luini, who says the FA charged 7,500 pounds per minute of FA Cup footage. In the total budget, it comes to 160K US dollars. Next, we have to battle between the battle between authenticity and privacy. Typically, football clubs, or in locker rooms of football clubs, has always been secret. However, docu series have this, this means of bringing the inside of the locker room to the general public. Those are the values of docu series whereby they engage the fans. Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp has gone on record and saying he doesn't want cameras in his locker room simply because it spoils the sanctity of the locker room. So at that point, football clubs will have to consider which do we want? Do we want the authenticity or do we want to keep our privacy? Then you have legal issues. Firstly, who owns the property of the docker series? Is it the football club? Is it an agency? Is it an OTT company? Then you have to consider if it's going to house, if the docker series is going to be housed in, within an OTT company for how long, in what territories, and how exclusive is that? Those have to be sorted out in initial contracts. Then you have to also ensure that all data protection, all data protection and data privacy um, rules are adhered to. Further to that, we also know that certain situations, clubs could actually be given permission to go into other clubs' territory to Australia to actually um, film footage, but they may not be allowed despite having um, permission from the National League. Such was the case with Wrexham again, where clubs simply didn't want them on their premises. Fourth, the, the aftermath. When documentaries are re released, we are aware that there's going to be some evaluation reviews, and with such, there will be criticism. With this criticism, we think that it's imp you can turn this criticism into a positive. How? Fan observe fan behavior. 
who are the focal actors in which the fans are actually interested in. And from there, you could use to make better episodes or ensuring season, as the case may be. Then, are docu series commercially viable? From SDA Bakuni will learn that a lot of things in the sports industry depends. So, if yes, what are the factors to be considered? Do you have enough human resources, um, to, human or financial resources? Not everyone is Ryan Reynolds or Rob McKelly to conduct a docu series in the way Wrexham have done it. You have to check that as a football club. Universal support. As mentioned, some managers are adverse to that, so you have to ensure your stakeholders, managers, or cl or pl and players are actually on board with your series. For whatever reason, some sponsors may not want to be associated with your docu series. What is your unique story? From our, from our findings, we've observed that the clubs who have, made, who have more commercially successful with their docu series are the clubs who have a unique story to tell, be it their Hollywood superstars, be it their history, be their community, you have to have a unique story to tell the public. That creates the immersive, engaging feeling for fans. Last but not least, the ownership of the products. We believe that, we know that if you own your products, you have the right to leverage those products. And such, again, is the case with Wrexham, who, as we're told by Jeff Luini, they are in the process of trademarking the Welcome to Wrexham brand in the US and the UK, thereby creating another entity for the club Wrexham to, to um, gain from commercially. In conclusion, we know that the marriage, the long historical love story between football and media has brought up upon us in, the tw in this past decade, the OTTs. Therefore, we think the OTTs have a means of, one, engaging new fans, improving the brand image of football clubs, and also making it commercially viable too. In addition to that, it gives the OTT a uh, new content in which they can engage new sports fans. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations on your excellent presentation. Forgot to mention that uh, the supervisor is Professor Marco Elefanti. Uh, now it's time for questions, and uh, Hello. I'd like to see. I already have the microphone. You have a question, of course. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, so, you know, your, your question there at the end, is it commercially viable? Um, and in reading your project, I know you had mentioned that the Premier League has not wanted to, to take this on, and I guess that question is kind of, why not? Or do you think there's a good reason for them to if you think about the United States and Hard Knocks, which is the docu-series for the National Football League, there was a break when teams didn't want to do it, but the NFL then forced teams in the, um, in the league to do it. They put in some exemptions, depending on if you kind of made it quite far into the postseason the previous year or have the first year head coach. But otherwise, they want to force a rotation to get everyone to do it. The league is totally behind it. How do you see that perhaps coming to the Premier League um, and thoughts on, on that model? Thank you for your question. Um, yes, we found out that not everyone wants to engage in with the docu-series. And they, uh, it might be due to challenges. In case of the Premier League, um, it, it was only news reports. So there wasn't like much information that there's not like certain reason they said that they don't want to do it. But we think that it might be a couple of reasons for that. The first one being that not every club in Premier League wants to engage with that. One of them, we know that it's Leicester uh, City Football Club. Uh, actually, at the time that we visited that club, uh, one of our colleagues asked the question if they wanted to do a docu-series. And they answered they don't want to engage in a docu-series because they think that it's a very intimate area and they don't want to share their dressing room with the rest of the world. The other reason might be, uh, so we found out there are two ways of doing that in, in our case studies. For example, for Arsenal All or Nothing, uh, the production company actually, Amazon, came 
to Arsenal, and they offered money to them to be a subject of a docu-series. On the other hand, uh, Arsenal took the money, by the way, and then they agreed for a season and they engaged in a production. On the other hand, for example, in Wrexham, Wrexham uh, owners bought the club to do a docu-series, actually. Like, they, were, they, they went hand in hand. So in the case of Wrexham, it, it's a different model. They actually own the product of docu-series themselves. So for Welcome to Wrexham, the owners of the docu-series are Ryan Reynolds and Rob McKelney. So they can leverage on more uh, with the docu-series because they have the trademark of it. So maybe uh, another reason the Premier League doesn't want to do that is maybe they're working on a different uh, project that is more uh, sustainable in the long term financially rather than just taking a cash of money and then engaging it in it for just one season. Can I, can I add something to this? You had it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, having all the clubs to agree on one format, one narrative. Uh, we, we have been exposed with Jeff Lewini, the executive producer of Welcome to Wrexham, on the production and post-production um, process. It's so long, it takes so much time, and it's one club. Imagine having all these clubs trying to convince them to agree on one storyline, having all these amendments and stuff. Uh, also, I think it might be a good opportunity to the Premier League to be a separate product with the current broadcasters because they have an amount of things that being delivered with their contracts. So in the upcoming period, it might be a potential revenue stream for the Premier League. Okay. Uh, James Panther, next question. Hello there. Yeah, so my question, I know in Drive to Survive there's quite a bit of editing where quotes or interviews from one part of the season are used at another part of the season for dramatic effect. And I just wondered as part of your research whether you think that is justifiable from a sort of commercial point of view or whether these series should really be more like documentaries and give you the real, you know, real life scenario. So do, which way do you think these series should go? Should they be true to life? or should they be edited for dramatic effect? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, this was definitely something that we've spoken about um, at length as a group. I think as well a few days ago with the interview that came out with Delhi Ali, I don't know if you saw, uh, but you know, some words basically were taken uh, out of context in the, in the, about the way he trained, uh, and that was included in the doc series. And then Jose Mourinho later apologised that that wasn't included. So Deli Ali was, a, you know, his character was arguably, you know, not a, he didn't look very good in that situation. So I think the way in which we view it is that, uh, you know, as seen through the two case studies that we analysed sports in itself and, and the quote at the beginning, you know, that provides enough in our, in our view, you know, the highs and the lows of winning, going for trophies, the community, everything you can bring into a docu-series. So, um, you know, in, in, in terms of sort of curating it to, for, for the entertainment factor, but including maybe things that aren't exactly true, we would, you know, advise, advise against. Okay, next question. There is one. Kevin, yeah. Thank you, group. Your examples, the case studies, are largely, let's say, very positive. I, I know you presented the challenges you know, at the end. You said not every aspect of docuseries is positive. However, my question to you is really with respect to, to the Wrexham case. Okay, you, you highlight all of the benefits, the positives. How much of that do you think is it a complete outlier, a positive outlier, and how replicable is that by other clubs? Just, I know this is not the focus of your research, but I am curious now that you've done it to have a sense of whether or not that is simply an outlier or is it something that is replicable because it is very much a, you know, it's almost as if they have a first mover advantage, right, Wrexham in the thing. Do you think every club 
in the you know top four divisions could potentially reproduce that or not. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we do understand that Rexham is an outlier. They have the Hollywood Supercell notoriety. They own the production company. So yes, in that sense, they are an outlier. But having said that, we have seen that if conducted properly, you can actually still reap the commercial rewards from it. Sunland is a good example whereby their docker series you gain a lot, a lot of notoriety for its involvement with the community, for highlighting their history as well. So I think Despite Sunderland not having, should I say, the resources of Rexham, be it the Hollywood connections and the re financial resources as well, Sunderland were actually able to do a pretty decent, more than decent docker series, which actually gained a lot of economic rewards for them as a football club. Okay. If there is no more question, then we could move forward. And thank you very much. I invite group uh, seven to come on stage and make their presentation. I'll change. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon to those also watching uh, live. I'd like to introduce you to Group 7, Myself, Bushebetu Dumbu from South Africa. On my right, I have Matteo Peruze from Spain and France. And my far right, we have Vanj Bahal from India. We would like to introduce you to a different dimension of the sporting industry. is eSports. However, this is also eSports. This date marks a significant moment in the eSports industry. On this day, players decided enough is enough, and they stood up against a game publisher. To put this into context, this could be equivalent to the NBA walkout in 2011. The gaming industry has gone through a major shift from gaming for leisure to a professional esport industry, one that can boast $1.5 billion of prize money distributed within esports and an average salary of 314,000 for a top tier player. But despite the glamour, it does have its issues such as short careers, burnout, and precarious contracts. 
But with this, we've seen a number of players associations emerging, which this gave birth to our research question. What learnings can be extracted from the players associations that have emerged so far in the esports landscape? But before we do this, we would like to take you through our journey, followed by the analysis of our case studies, and lastly, present our findings, which will answer our research question. Our journey was initially inspired by our visit to the Professional Football Association, where they spoke about player relations and how they dealt with it. This was further cemented by a guest lecture by Dr. Emily Hayday, who highlighted issues within esports. This led to our initial focus of understanding the needs of players. With that, our literature review focused on three key areas. One, professionalization of esports. Two, industrial relations in esports. And finally, the role of players associations in sport. The journey of a thousand miles filled with many twists and turns led us to focusing on two major player associations, the League of Legends Championship Series Players Association and also the Counter-Strike Professional Players Association and exploring the development, achievements and challenges of these associations. But to fully understand the landscape, we conducted eight interviews within four categories of primary stakeholders. The interviews included game publishers, teams, tournament organizers, and game pub and publishers, and players associations. Despite the challenging nature of our project, our objectives served as another key motivator. These objectives being explaining key factors surrounding unionization in esports, providing learnings about the governance of esports ecosystems, offer an in-depth study of the players, players associations that have emerged, and finally, find out about the challenges faced by these esports player associations. But we are well aware that throughout our journey, we will encounter some research limitations. The first being that it is currently a sensitive topic within the industry. Secondly, the access to key stakeholders, because these stakeholders as well find it difficult to publicly speak about this topic. And lastly, despite our best efforts, it was difficult to gain the voice of players and be able to hear their views. Despite this industry being professionalized as it is, as I've mentioned, it does have its issues. But a lot can be extracted and learned from major players associations that exist in traditional sport. Some of these include the importance of educating players about solidarity and the importance of, of organizing. Secondly, the right to arbitration, where, where cases are not being heard at civil courts but internally within the leagues. The ability and the willingness of players to sacrifice their careers, to go on this arduous task of establishing a strong players association. Despite these learnings, one must understand that players face different limitations as well and I'll focus on two. The first being that the majority of these professional athletes are young of age. Some starting at 16, and in most cases peaking at the age of 18. So there is no level of education or interest to understand the precarities of what it takes to go into establishing a players association. And secondly, the short career lifespan. It is difficult for them to invest the time that is required and the long journey required to establish a players association. 
Their focus purely becomes maximizing the time that they have within the industry. With these factors in mind, I hand over to Vanch and Matteo to explore our case studies. Thank you, Bukle. So, the esports ecosystem is quite complex. And to simplify, we divided our stakeholders into the five key and primary stakeholders that were important for this research. Firstly, remember that the game publishers are at the heart of the industry. They own the IP, they own the IP, they own the game, and they are the ones who develop the game. Secondly, the professional athletes are the players who participate either individually or in teams with different, within different competitions. Teams are, the, teams are the organizations that actually hire those players to compete in different competitions across the globe. Competition organizers can either be third party or they could be the publisher itself. And finally, and most importantly, the players associations that have been emerging now to stand up for player voices. In our interviews, we took some of these findings based on the structure of these stakeholders, the stakeholder dynamics, the support and governance of the esports ecosystem, and finally, what's the vision of the industry? Now we dive deep into the first case study, the LCSPA. The League of Legends is a strategy-based game that started in 2009 and was developed by Riot Games. Riot then developed, Riot then established a, a player association in 2017. And under three years, the association went independent of Riot Games and started a group licensing program. Riot then developed a lower division competition for its esports to develop player pathways, only to abolish the same competition within a few months. And that got us to 29th May 2023, the lockout, where the divisions from the top, the players from the top divisions actually stood up for the players in the lower division for the first time in the history of esports. Now we move on to the interviewees, interviewees that we had. For Riot Games, the publisher itself, we were able to talk with the esports lead of an emerging region. Then we went on to G2 Esports, which is one of the leading teams across the world. And we were able to actually interview the CEO. Moving on to the player association, we were privileged to interview with Phil Aram, who's the executive director of the LCSPA and the mastermind behind the walkout that just happened. Our case study would not be finished if we didn't talk about AVPA, which is another player association that branched out of the LCSPA of a different game from the same publisher. Now let's go into our insights. So Riot Games, our interview, we mainly focused on stakeholder engagement. And when talked about the publisher's relationships with players, he said, yes, we do have a responsibility to treat the players very fairly. However, keep, keep in mind that Riot Games does keep an arm's length when it comes to their individual relationship between the players and the teams itself. On governance, he said, esports is self-regulatory. There are so many regions that have no governing body, and thus the publishers take the space of being the self-regulators. Now we move on to G2 esports. The CEO focused mainly on talking about the players. He said that the players are the heart and soul of this team. However, he also mentioned that the salaries of these players is skyrocketing. It represents 150% of the economy of esports teams, and that needs some correction. His points on governance and on player associations were pretty clear. He said that the publishers actually play a role of the international federations like in traditional sport. And when it comes to player associations, he said, I don't need another self-serving body. Yes, players or player voices are important, but a legal entity like a player association might not be the best way. Then we move on to the main bits, the LCSPA. So the LCSPA has had very similar religions to the MLBPA in baseball. The MLBPA was established by the league, similar to how LCSPA was established by the publisher. And now it has gone independent into a self-funding model. When it comes to programs, they've had many successes, like the player contract database. But the concessions from the last walkout are what's key, and they can't be overstated. The, the walkout was partially successful, 
as they started discussing with Riot on the lower division formats. Secondly, we started talking about the stakeholder engagement. And, and we focused on a lot of things. But the main point here from Phil was that the publishers are the arbitrators of the system. They have a big responsibility to establish minimum standards of the industry. Phil also mentioned that players should actually be classified as employees under the California classification law. Now, finally, we went on to governance, and it was very similar. His viewpoint was publishers are, again, the international federations. And we don't really need another governing body like a FIFA for the esports industry, because eventually, the publisher hold the power. Finally, he also said that the publishers do need to step up, because currently, they just do a selective responsibility of governing some parts of the industry. And finally, the AVPA, which is the America's Valorant Players Association, which was established for the players of a game called Valorant, which was developed by Riot itself. However the, game, however, the game is developed by Riot, the idea for the AVPA actually stemmed out from the LCSPA, the previous player association we talked about. The, because they wanted to capitalize on the know-how and wanted to expand into a game that was developed by the same publisher, which brought us to a good point about understanding potential frameworks that could exist, one being one player association for different games under the same publisher. And now we move on to the second case study, which is a purely independent players association. Thanks, Vansh. So now we've seen, we've talked about a players association that turned independent, and it's been working well. But before they went independent, there was already a players association in esports that had been established independently by the players. We're now looking at the Counter-Strike Professional Players Association, an association that entered esports quite strongly, but ended up losing its momentum. Some say that due to some wrong decisions being taken, others would say that they were up against too hostile of an environment. So the CSPPA was formed in 2018 by seven players with the help of experienced sports union professionals from Denmark. The turning point in the CSPPA's work came in 2020 when they signed breakthrough agreements with tournament organizers. However, after that, the association entered a decline phase up to about a year ago when it became inactive. So that's the timeline, briefly, and these are the stakeholders that we interviewed for this case study. We were lucky to speak to the two main tournament organizers in Counter-Strike, ESL and Blast, including the league commissioner for the ESL Pro League, which is the biggest tournament in Counter-Strike. On the team perspective, we spoke to Team Vitality, a French team that just claimed its biggest success in the scene. With the association, it was quite difficult to get any insights because they are actually inactive right now, but we ultimately managed to get insight from someone connected to the CSPPA. And regarding the game publisher Valve, it was, we were unable to, gather, uh, to have an interview, but we gathered good insights from the other interviewees. So the first thing to understand about Valve is that it's much more than a game publisher. Video game development is not its core business, and esports is not among its top priorities. This might explain the hands-off approach that they have regarding the competitive industry that has been built around their games, whereby they're quite happy to delegate the organizer function to third parties. These third parties, such as ESL and Blast, they run the competitions. Regarding their stakeholder engagement, uh, interestingly, ESL Pro League has a player council where players can uh, have a conversation regularly with the league commissioner, and then the league commissioner brings out these views and balances them with other stakeholders' perspectives. When asked about the Players Association, they both, based on their previous experience working or dealing with the CSPPA, had some comments. 
They mention some maybe mistakes, for example, an instance where the CSPPA seemed to misunderstand the preferences of their own players regarding the tournament calendar. While on the positive end, one of the interviewees highlighted how the CSPPA brought a much needed standardization across tournament organizers and the conditions they offer at their events. Then, to gather a team's perspective, we spoke to Team Vitality, as we just mentioned, a team from France that just claimed their biggest success. Um, so, regarding their relationship, the Players Association, they don't deal directly as a team with the PA. That's, the PA deals with leagues and players. But our interviewee had some opinions uh, regarding Players Associations. Her point of view is that Sometimes they are missing the bigger picture of the esports industry and that they would need people that understand both sides of the table to actually have more reasonable demands. Then, on the governance on the industry, her point was very clear. No one can be ever above publishers. And regarding the player council that we just talked about from ESL, she had a very favorable view, maybe because Player Council lacks the teeth of players' associations. And now, finally, we get to our protagonist, in this case study, the CSPPA. So the CSPPA, as we said, had a player board and then had a management team which came from the world of sports unions, concretely the Danish Football Players Union. The membership of the association was very diverse, at about 300 players from all over the world, but also from the elite to the semi-pro players. This diversity made it quite challenging to reach consensus on certain decisions. Um, in terms of their activity, so they offered contract advice and they also rolled out programs related to player welfare. And here they also drew on their experience working with football players and athletes from Denmark and Europe in general. So as we mentioned, the turning point for the CSPPA was the framework agreements they signed with tournament organizers. These were the closest thing there's been in esports to a collective bargaining agreement. They included items related to player compensation, like revenue sharing mechanisms. They also had a group licensing deal, which was to fund the association's projects, and also event minimum standards. However, these agreements crumbled after a few months. And then, as we said, the association entered a decline phase. The challenges they faced were great pushback from stakeholders in the industry who weren't happy to see player association and players claiming a bigger say. And then there was another problem, which is the fact that players started to burn out and focus on their careers. As we've seen in traditional sports, unionization was built on the back of players who made big sacrifices, but in esports, a, a competitive scene where careers are so short, it might be too demanding to sacrifice that time. On the governance side, the main point that we drew was the fact that there's an urgent need for dispute resolution in the industry as of right now. Players can't afford to enforce their contracts when they are not respected because of the high costs of litigation. Now that wraps up our second case study. I'll hand it over to Bukle for our findings and conclusions. To conclude, I'll remind you of our research question. What learnings can be extracted from the players associations that have emerged so far in the esports landscape? Amongst the many findings that we had, the focus for today is on player associations. It is very clear that there is no one-size-fits-all framework. To bring it to context, that would be asking one player association in traditional sports to look after the needs of tennis players, rugby players, football players, which they have different needs and different requirements. Such is the reality in eSports. E Secondly, we see that the relationship between the LCSPA and AVPA is a possible model that is working currently, where it is two players' associations under one 
game developer. So there is hope for the industry. But with all that said, there is no perfect answer, nor do we have a crystal ball to predict what the future holds, or how these events where players have taken up a stand will result. But all we can try to do as Group 7 is to shed light on this subject. To my group members, the class, and to the scientific committee, it's game over. Congratulations, Group 7, on your excellent presentation. I still have to mention that the supervisor, your supervisor, was Dr. Uh, Kevin Marston. And now we have time for questions. Not because it's the last group that you have no question. This perhaps shows my ignorance of esports, but um, are the players' associations for both men and whatever few women might be playing professionally? Yes? You're just shaking your head, so it's just an easy question. <laughs> yes, it, that is the case. <laughs> I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, uh, building up on that, it's as we've seen, like the players' associations that we've studied are the ones that are. There's two currently. The CSPPA is inactive. So it's a very emerging stakeholder group, a very emerging type of organization. And yeah, they're also looking into how they can uh, affect positively the environment for women players. But yeah, they work in the same. Yes, you, you made the point at a certain moment in your presentation that uh, how, to, how to put them inside the logic of the unions as such. And in, in the conclusion, so where do you see the, the current strategy that the unions would most accept to, to take them as one of their members. The, the unions in general, the concept of, because the, if we look at football, if, you, if we look at other sports, it has been not an easy way to, to be accepted inside the general union's logic. And we can imagine for e-games, that's even worse uh, in the logic of the traditional union's mindset. What do you see the elements that can help uh, improve the integration of e-players inside a union logic? Thank you, Pierre. Um, like you said, like e for eSports, it's much more difficult. Uh, and right now, we took the element of unions, but we do realize the fact that unions currently are not actually possible within eSport. And that's why organizations like the CSPPA are associations. And why is that the case? Is because of classification law. Currently, eSport players, it's still being debated if they are the employees of the teams or are they independent contractors. And if they are employees, then in the future, there might be a scope of actually coming under the wing of a labor union. But up until there's a legal precedence that all esports employees across all titles are actually employees, we don't see them going into an umbrella of a sports union. Because by legal terms, a definition of a union involves a group of two or three employees of the organization. So until and unless you're not an employee, you can't really be, make a union yourself. So the idea is to focus more on organizations that set up like the LCSPA or the AVPA who are 
growing together to actually get to that legal precedence that esports players are actually employees. Okay, Professor Pauli. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, I'm interested in, in the age dynamics within the associations. So obviously lots of the professionals, as you said early on, are minors, they're 16, maybe even younger, I don't know. Um, who's running it, who's making decisions? How are they bringing in the younger guys who are you know, gonna be very inexperienced in areas of labor and contract and so on, but they're at the top of their game as esports professionals. So can you maybe just say a little bit about, there's no question, can you just say a little bit about the age dynamics within the player associations, please? Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah Matt, I think um, the age dynamic is very, it's, 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 it's very interesting here because we've seen players who won $3 million one day and they were 16. So uh, when it comes to players association, how the successful player associations have been set up is learning from the CSPPA actually, where the player groups were not very informed, they were not well educated, they did, and they were young. So now the LCSPS approach has been different, and that's why they appointed Phil Aram, who comes from a union background, who is the executive director. And again, it's very similar to the MLBPA, where Marvin Miller was sent in to actually set up and inform the players. So we are dealing with a group that's completely uneducated right now when it comes to players association. They're, they're very young, but what we understood is that within the structure of these associations, now there's first going to be someone who understands both sides, and then there's going to be a player, player council or a player leadership board. So although the power still vests with the player group, uh, but it's being advised and it's being reached out through, through a funnel of advisors. Like in both LCSP and AVPA, they have an advisory board that exists of lawyers, Med, men, mental health professionals, mental coaches, so that's where the flow is coming from to actually influence the decisions that the player leadership board is making uh, in the association. Okay, yeah, and just to add, if I may, a bit more insight that we took from our interviews on underage players, we asked stakeholders, like, how do you deal with underage players? Normally there's the parents or legal guardians involved. Agents, we weren't able to cover it in depth here, but agents have a big role in the industry. Some have a favorable, well, there's, yeah, there's good and bad agents as in every industry, of course, but they have a big role. And also on the age of players, we found it interesting, we mentioned in our paper, for example, in China, they implemented a law that minor players can't compete in esports. And that, well, the, it, a lot of competitive scenes like Fortnite, the players are between 15 and 18, that's when they peak. So there, the Chinese industry, Without minor players, it's completely transformed. And um, yeah, there's interesting things there as well. Okay, um, you, you have a question, Kevin? Because time is... Yes, a quick one. Thank you, Denis. Okay. Yeah. I just want you to pick up and expand uh, briefly on the question of legal classification and minors. You, you just mentioned it, Matteo. The, the issue, and this is where I would like your feedback on the walkout. The walkout you mentioned is very recent. What is going to be the impact of this on players' associations in your sense? Because you give the example, two interesting examples, one player association which functions, and another one which is in decline, which is interesting because it's not just everything is beautiful with players' associations. There's a reality here. And what I would like to know from your perspective is with respect to the fact that so many of the players are young, underage minors, and we are talking about professionalization, which in theory, as you mentioned, has a status either of independent contractor or an employee. But if the player in question is a minor, they are legally not allowed to even engage in, in professional activity. So how do we deal with this dynamic and where do you think, what, what is the ultimate, uh, what will happen with this walkout in terms of players associations with respect to the fact that all of these young players are minors? Uh, 
Okay, um, the first thing that needs to be taken into note is the fact that the current laws that govern uh, traditional sports, unfortunately, were not built uh, with the foresight of this industry coming into play. So that makes it already a difficult uh, element. But the fact that um, with that, there has been consideration towards either looking forward and shaping laws around governing esports, but even that has become difficult because there's obviously the classification whether they're an employee or they're an independent contractor, and w which one, one uh, esports uh, athletes fall into are afforded certain legal protections. So that's the big debate currently right now. Yeah, and I mean, about the walkout, I think in our discussions with Phil, um, I think it was pretty clear that the walkout was historical in the sense that it's the first time an industrial action against a publisher has been taken, and that was because of the players. Um, but he also mentioned that they're far from anything that they've achieved right now. So the idea is that what LCSP has done right now is going to impact not just like the miners, but it's going to impact the whole industry in a lot of ways, which actually no one knows about. But this, uh, like this walkout is a great lit litmus test to what legal precedents can come in the future. And one of them is the way you deal with miners for sure. I think in our discussions, he did talk about that as well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, we are at the end of this very rich session. And uh, I'm sure that you have enjoyed the diversity of the topic chosen by our students and also the quality of the presentation. And I think all groups, all students, deserve a big round of applause. Now you can relax until tomorrow. The emotion will come. After one year of hard work, you will have your uh, graduation, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy the moment. Uh, thank you all once again for having stayed until the end of the afternoon. I really appreciate your presence, uh, and uh, thank you for your interests and your participation in, in this uh, important session. I invite you to move outside for drinks, different drinks, I think, uh, than what you have. <laughs> the Coca-Cola you have <laughs> been able to drink and uh, the water. Uh, I remind my colleagues in the scientific committee that they have no time for drinks because we still have some work to do to assess uh, the presentation of the day. And uh, a room has been reserved for us. And uh, uh, please join the room as soon as, as you can. Again, thank you all. Thank you very much. And hope to see you tomorrow.
can, can you help us please?